Okay, everybody's here for a computer architecture? Okay, good. You're here for a tough class? Fun class? Both? A good combination? Okay, it's gonna be fun, I think. We're gonna talk a lot about computer architecture, but as I said, I think the mindset of an architect is already present in real life, right? This little thing triggered my mindset of an architect, and I immediately want to solve the problem, right? And the solution, uh, solutions are actually very fundamental too, right? You're bound by some uh, metric that is really important for you at that point in time, in this case, energy, battery life. And the solution uh, that we could propose could be better batteries. Although I don't know if it's working now. It's not green anymore. Okay. I don't like why it's not green. Anybody has any guesses? But it's not green. It's supposed to be green, I think. Okay, I think we'll do it for now. And the solution is actually redundancy. <laughs> and redundancy can buy you a lot of problems. It, it doesn't, in this case, uh, one thing runs out of energy, but in, in some other case, it may actually have a fault, right? And because of the fault, uh, you can tolerate that fault by having redundancy, by having another one of these. And if you have two faults, both of them are faulty, you have triple modular redundancy. Of course, that's an expensive solution. You may not want that. You may want something else inside here that's more reconfigurable to fix the problem. So there's a huge design space, as you can see, in architecture. And this is another thing in architecture. This is architecture of, I guess, the things that we build around us. And computer architecture, in my opinion, is no different, except uh, the trade-offs that you make are in a different space. Uh, you basically design systems, and you're constrained by different constraints, as we will see. That's why I like starting these lectures with uh, not necessarily computer architecture, but real architecture. And this is one of the things that I like in Zurich. You probably know what that is. Does anybody know what this is? Yes? Yes. Start off. Yes, perfect. That's, it's a beautiful view, I think. How many of you have been there? Okay, many people, yeah. I guess other people who haven't been there should go there. It's not that far. You can actually walk there. Uh, it's beautiful, as you can see, uh, and it's it's a, it's one of the actually it's one of the earliest works of an architect. Does anybody know who that architect is? It's called yes, Calatrava. yes, Calatrava, Santiago Calatrava, who was actually uh, this person. Well, um, I'll, I'll tell him, tell about him, but who was actually an ETH alumnus in civil engineering, and this was the first big work that he was commissioned to do in Zurich, and then later on he became famous, of course. I'm not sure if he is building stuff in Zurich anymore, but he's definitely building very expensive stuff in the world. But this is the first major piece of a famous architect, uh, and it's, it's distinctive, it's not, a, it's not your usual train station. And when I first went there, actually, a few years ago, uh, I was actually quite impressed, because it's definitely different, and it's very, you can, you can see this zoomorphic design. As you can see, uh, this, it became the signatures of his work, straight lines and right angles are rare, and things are more like uh, an animal, a bird, actually. Uh, and this is the person, as you can see. Uh, okay, you can read more about him, and he's very famous for many, many other works. But there is a principle behind his works. And this is, a, this is another one of these works. Does anybody know what this is? Oculus. Oculus, yes. People who have been to New York would probably know this. Anybody else? Has anyone seen it? That's a good assignment. Uh, yeah, there's someone more person. I cannot see it very well over there. Maybe we can reduce this even more because if you know how to do it, maybe it's the best for you to do it before I messed up. Yeah, this is the Oculus, and uh, this was designed by the same architect. And as you can see there are similarities, right? Over here, these uh, bones of the bird, <laughs> bird's wings, and these are also bird's wings. But this is a much more expensive structure. Uh, so basically, this is the master. Uh, I, a lot of people consider this as his masterpiece, but of course, he's still alive. He may not. He may do another masterpiece uh, going forward. And this was actually, uh, you can see that it resembles a bird being released from a child's hand. The roof was originally designed to mechanically open to increase light and ventilation to the enclosed space, but because of security and cost constraints, they actually got rid of that. 
now you can see the constraints, right? There's a constraint in design. Uh, and uh, you can read more about it, basically. This is, uh, this is the positive commentary saying that, oh, this is great. There is also, uh, even, even uh, by the way, this cost about $4 billion, I think, for the New Yorkers. So New Yorkers were not very happy about it while it was being constructed. But now that it's there, everybody loves it, I think. <laughs> Nobody remembers the cost after some point. But I think they, they I mean, what, what option do you have, right? You have to enjoy it now. <laughs> Okay, so there are design constraints that actually, even for a costly thing, such a costly thing, there were design constraints. For example, uh, there, this is from Wikipedia, you can read it in more detail, but the soaring spike design was scaled back because of security issues, and the thing doesn't open and close, and some people criticize it by saying, uh, Calatrava's bird has grown a beak. Its ribs have doubled in number, and its wings have lost their interstices of glass and blah, blah, uh, and it may now evoke a slender stegosaurus more than it does a bird. <laughs> what is a stegosaurus? That's a stegosaurus. <laughs> I, th I, I find it interesting. I mean, it's, it's good to have this critical view. Uh, this person is definitely critical, uh, but maybe that's true, maybe not, uh, but people enjoy it now. Uh, okay, basically these are, no one is immune to the design constraints. That's my big point over here. If somebody tells you, oh, I'm going to design the biggest supercomputer in the world, and I have no constraints, I can easily tell that that's uh, a mistake. <laughs> I don't think there are any, there's nothing that's not constrained at all. You have to be constrained by something. Power, probably power. If you're not constrained by money, you're going to be constrained by power. <laughs> and those are one of the, some of the biggest constraints today. And in this case, you can see that because of budget and space constraints, the design was, was modified to eliminate the opening and closing of the roof mechanism. And you can see the $4 billion uh, price tag over here, almost $4 billion. And it's a transportation hub. I, I didn't say that. It's a multifunction thing. It's not just, an, uh, just a beautiful art uh, or architecture building sitting over there, but underneath there's a huge station over there. And you can take trains uh, as well as uh, mm, uh, metro to many places. I've done that many times. Okay. We're going to talk about design constraints a little bit, but I want to get the mindset in the right place uh, first, because everything around you as, is actually uh, cons uh, designed based on some constraints. Constraints are always different, of course, right? In this case, this may not have looked like that uh, if uh, Cloud Java didn't have this much budget, right? And in fact, this is very close to the World Trade Center station. It's, if, you, if you go there, it's all, there's also a constraint in terms of space. It's in the middle of many, many tall buildings over there. So that's why these, these, wouldn't, uh, these couldn't be very long as well. Anyway, I don't want to analyze this. It's not, a, it's not an architecture course in the architecture sense. Maybe architects analyze this more. Uh, but I think there is a huge resemblance between real architecture and computer architecture. Uh, both are about design. Both are about constraints. Both are about creativity uh, for different purposes. Real architects do have, are creative for some other reason, right? For people, people's benefit, people's, uh, uh, how, how much they enjoy a space, for example. And actually, some of them are using uh, real computers to be able to figure that out. Uh, in computer architecture, it's very similar, right? You're designing these things for a problem, to solve problems for users. So you have to take into account uh, them and their constraints. And you have to be creative in terms of solving the real problems that they have. Okay, another question. This is, anybody know what this is? I know at least several people should know. <laughs> you don't know? Falling water. Falling water, yes. <laughs> You look like you know, that's why I asked. <laughs> yes, this is falling water. Uh, anybody else? No? So this is actually a masterpiece of another architect that is taught in Architecture 101 class. If you take Architecture 101, I'm sure you're going to see this. Uh, and this is the architect. This is Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, a very famous American architect. Uh, he's not alive anymore. But uh, this is close to where I used to teach, Carnegie Mellon University. And uh, it's only one hour, 15 minutes. And you can see that it, it, it's an important masterpiece. Uh, and why is it important? I mean, we're going to get back to this. But uh, if you look at this, there's, there's, there's another principle behind it, right? This is the organic architecture, basically. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright believed that uh, the things that you, I'm not sure if this is a recording. So we have a lot of design constraints here also. But he, uh, is there another one we can get from some other room? We should probably try that while I'm trying to do this. OK. 
because I get a red and green and it's, it's flaky. <laughs> it's like a bit that flips from one to zero once in a while, right? You cannot trust that. And we're going to talk about that also, actually. <laughs> you don't want flaky things when, you're, when, you, when you actually want to achieve some goal. Uh, okay, so basically he had a, another principle. The principle was organic architecture. And in this case, this uh, building is designed very carefully to fit very well within its environment. And you can see that these cantilevers over here are actually imitating uh, the waterfall that the building is on. So it's really an imitation of the waterfall. And this thing is really on a, on a waterfall. If you go over there, you'll see water flowing underneath it. It's not an easy place to design a building or build it. OK, and that's the architect, as we said. So your first assignment in this course, uh, this is what I used to give uh, at CMU, uh, go to falling water. But since falling water is a bit close and hard to reach from here, uh, I would definitely recommend falling water also. But I think the first one would be Bahn of Stadelhofen. It's very easy to go there. Uh, extra credit, repeat for Oculus. And other people who have taken this course actually sent me pictures from Oculus. I have not received a picture from falling water yet from an ATH student. <laughs> I've received a lot of pictures from CMU students who have been to falling water. <laughs> but if you do that for all of them, then you get extra, a lot of extra credit. <laughs> and more importantly, I think you will enjoy the beauty of these places and understand uh, the importance of out of the box and creative thinking. And I think it's good to maybe after this course, uh, you'll have a different mindset. And you may think about the trade-offs in the design of the Bahnhof, for example, how, because it, it's a combination of utility as well as art, right? Uh, you need to balance that trade-off. If it's only art and it's not usable, then there's a problem. If it's only us utility and there's no art, then it's not as nice, right? So there's a trade-off uh, that, that's made. And there's strengths, weaknesses, and goals of the design. Cost is always there, right? Actually, Bahnhof Stadlofen was also costly for its time. Uh, I think it started in 1983. Uh, and you can derive your principles on your, own, on your own for good design and innovation as well, right? And, and these guys, actually, these architects, they, don't, they derive their own principles, right? They learned uh, from the past. And we're going to talk about that a little bit also uh, while we're setting the mindset. OK, uh, so due, it's due date is any time during the course. I think you can do this more easily. Uh, later during the course is probably better, but you can apply what you have learned in this course, basically. And I think the key point that I have is think out of the box. These are not regular train stations, or actually, <laughs> even Oculus is a train station right <laughs> underneath. Uh, and I, I actually, um, Calatrava built a lot of train stations. I'm going to show you a couple more examples. Uh, uh, but these are not regular buildings also. So it's, it's good to understand thinking out of the box. And this is very much needed today when we're designing computing systems, computing platforms, software, anything, because we're really reaching our limits in terms of scalability, in terms of energy efficiency, in terms of power delivery, in terms of area, everything. We want to achieve everything at the same time at high performance, at very, li very little energy, very little cost, but that requires out-of-the-box thinking. We're, we're going to talk uh, a lot about energy uh, later in the course. Data, uh, if we're building these huge data centers, it's not clear that if this is going to be sustainable going into the future. There are many, many sustainability issues we have in the world today, but computing is, in, is an increasing fraction of that sustainability problem. It's consuming a significant fraction of the energy of the world. I think the latest numbers I've seen are about 5% of the entire world's power is spent on data centers. That's a lot, right? And it's growing, actually. It's not clear if this is the right way to go. Uh, of course, computing can enable a lot of efficiency in some other uh, areas. For example, if we could improve the efficiency of everything else, uh, I don't know, maybe driving, I don't, uh, it's not clear. Uh, maybe we'll reduce the energy in other areas, but if we substitute that with much higher energy in computing side, then we're not better off, right? So this is good, it's a good perspective to have, the sustainability perspective. We're not going to cover a lot, but a lot of things that we're going to discuss are actually going to the heart of sustainability. For example, are we doing the processing in the right place? Even in something as simple as this. This is consuming a lot of energy because it's moving a lot of data internally, unnecessarily. If you had a different paradigm, if we thought out of the box and enabled that, maybe we could reduce energy by significant amounts, 10x, 20x, 40x, 100x, and become more sustainable. OK, so today's first assignment, uh, we're going to have some fun before we start talking about uh, some, some topics. Uh, basically, find the difference of this and that. This is this, and this is that. <laughs> 
So there are differences clearly, right? Of course, we're not going to do this exercise literally, but this is a masterpiece. This is just a regular train station, which may be okay. Uh, basically, you can list them after you complete the first assignment. Uh, so how do you evaluate designs? That's what I'm getting at, actually. You have these two designs right now. How do you compare between them? And there are many, many evaluation criteria for the designs. That's true for real architecture. That's true for, I don't know, when I compare this microphone and this microphone also, right? They're two different designs. Uh, and there are many criteria. Functionality, of course, does it meet the specification? So somebody specified something, probably, for it. Uh, or maybe sometimes specification is nebulous, right? In architecture, it may be nebulous, but uh, usually you have some interface that you have to obey, right? The hardware-software interface. The software expect, it gives you an instruction, there's a contract, and you have to execute that instruction as written in the contract. That's the functionality part. Uh, but also a functionality could be from the viewpoint of the user, right? That interface is not very well specified. This thing may be very well functional for me, but it may not be very well functional for someone else because they hate doing this, right? You may want to talk to it, right? That's, that's another functionality perspective. Uh, so if some functionality is well specified, some functionality is not well specified. And as an architect, you have to, you have to make the trade-off such that you achieve functionality that's good for whoever your users are or whatever your problem is, whatever the problem you're solving is. Reliability is another one we just discussed this, right? Reliability is cl critically important, of course. Uh, but of course, uh, reliability may be relaxed also. Some people may not care about reliability as much. Some other people may care about reliability. So there are clearly dis different, uh, uh, different uh, uh, points in the space what uh, in terms of what people can tolerate. For example, one thing we may talk about later on is, do you have to do every single computation uh, precisely? Or can you somehow sometimes give slightly wrong results? <laughs> when is it okay? When is it not okay? Can you be somewhat approximate? It may be okay sometimes, right? Because the algorithm, so let's say you do an ad and the addition is not perfect, you get an error a little bit, but the error is not huge. At the grand scheme of things, the algorithm may be able to tolerate that error, right? It, because it may be looking at many, many of these additions and one of them being incorrect is not important because it's going to be voted out by many of the other additions that you're going to do. So this is, for example, a lot of machine learning algorithms work this way. They work on a lot of data. And if one of the inputs is incorrect, maybe it's okay because there are a million other inputs that it's going to learn from correctly. So even the reliability is a criteria that's, that could be fuzzy. Of course, it's good to define it somehow, but this is an, it's an evaluation criteria that we have. Uh, criterion that we have. And you can apply it to whatever we saw before also, right? These things, these two things, how reliable they are. I don't know, it's, it's more complex analysis, of course, than what we can do here. Space requirements, how big is the area? That's always a problem, right? <laughs> you don't want a huge chip inside this, for example. Uh, you, you would like to reduce it as much as possible. Uh, and that also relates to cost, but cost is, uh, there, cost is a much more complex equation also. Uh, so clearly there are many, many criteria. I don't know if I want to go over all of this. Expandability is another one. How do you expand the architecture? Uh, can you accommodate things that you may not have anticipated, right? Because you're designing something, it's going to be used for decades and decades and decades maybe. Well, in computing, I think it's hard to do for decades, but in real architecture, you have things that are used for decades. But if you have an unanticipated situation, maybe somehow there is an error that happens can you have the design that's expandable a little bit such that it can accommodate and fix it? Flexib flexibilities could be another word for it maybe. Uh, but how flexible is your design? How expandable is your design? Mm. In buildings, expandability make more sense perhaps. Comfort level of the users, happiness level, aesthetics, dot, dot, dot. Uh, there are many more over here, like energy. This is applied to buildings, I think, over here, but I'm getting ahead of myself and talking about computing as well. Uh, basically, how to evaluate goodness of design is always a critical question. It's never single dimensional. If you're building something real, you're never optimizing for a single metric. Uh, I, I, I'm, I have not seen it actually. You, you usually tr try to optimize for multiple metrics at the same time. Of course, sometimes one metric may be a little bit more important than the other one. But a, a good architect figures out how to actually balance this. That's why it's really about a mindset thing. You start with a mindset. That's different. It's, it's different from a regular optimization problem. Let's say you minimize, for example, this value. That's good, 
But then if it, if it comes at the cost of maximizing some other value, that's not good. OK, so a key question uh, that I have, I think, now that we've covered the metrics a little bit, how was Calatrava able to design especially his key buildings? I think all of them are key, actually, but Oculus is uh, probably one of the more key ones. You can have many guesses over here. Anybody has a guess? What's the biggest ingredient that enabled him to design this? Of course, I don't expect you to go into the head of Calatrava right now and figure it out. Even he may not know it. Or even that machine that is, that is in his head may not be uh, observable enough for us right, to figure out how he did it. And I, I believe that, actually, I don't think it's very observable. Observability in uh, existing machines is hard, but observability in something like this is, I don't know. <laughs> But we should, we should probably uh, work on it. OK, so there are many guesses. These are some of my guesses. Uh, you can see dollar, dollars, of course, are important, <laughs> or Swiss francs, depending on where you, do the, uh, where you design your architecture. But clearly, a lot of things got, got into it. And this is true, I believe. Like, clearly, he was a hard worker, perseverant, dedicated, uh, hard-headed a bit because he follows his principles. right? Uh, principle design, I'm going to talk more about that later on, but we're going to get to that slowly. Experience, creativity, out-of-the-box thinking. A good understanding of past principles, this is really important. I think I'm listing what it means to be a, an architect over here. Good judgment and intuition. Uh, maybe this goes against <laughs> the funding sometimes. He wants to design something really beautiful, but then funding uh, come, kicks in, and that, that makes it hard. Strong skill combination, that's really important. Math, architecture, art, and engineering. In fact, he was a civil engineer, as I said. Uh, or he is a civil engineer, but he's also an architect. Uh, luck, initiative, and entrepreneurialism. Maybe he reached out to people, right? If you don't reach out to people, maybe you don't create that luck also. And I think I'm going to focus on these a little bit more, basically. A strong understanding of and commitment to fundamentals. I think that's really important. Uh, since you're taking this course especially, that's really important to become a good designer and a good architect. And I think principle design is also important. There's no single principle in my opinion. There are many, many principles and you need to, it's, it's best to know all of those principles and figure out when to apply them at the right place to essentially achieve a right trade-off between different metrics. Okay, so hopefully you'll be exposed to and hopefully develop and enhance many of these skills in this course. It may be explicitly, usually implicitly, actually, but we're going to talk about a lot of these things. Uh, I, don't, I don't yet have a lot of funding, sorry, <laughs> but uh, we can figure out, if you have good ideas, we can figure out uh, how to get that funding also. That's through the entrepreneurialism and initiative, right? <laughs> okay, that's just a joke. <laughs> But who knows, if you have good ideas, today is a good time to make a difference. So it's, it's good to be entrepreneurial in spirit and think about uh, doing something big uh, uh, in, in that sense, in an entrepreneurial sense. We can talk about that later on. OK, let's talk about these two a little bit more. So what is principle design? Uh, this is, again, a quote from Kalatrava. Uh, there, uh, to me, there are two overriding principles to be found in nature which are most appropriate for building. So he's explaining his principles, basically. One is the optimal use of material. Efficiency, which is really important in computing architecture also. Uh, and the other is the capacity of organisms to change shape, to grow, and to move. Basically, he's designed actually a lot of buildings that open and close. Unfortunately, he was not allowed to do that <laughs> with, with the Oculus, but he has other buildings. Uh, if, if you look online, you'll find them. Uh, and other people have written things like this, basically. His constructions are inspired by natural forms like plants, bergwins, and the human body. This is another example of a train station. Does anybody know where this is? Lisbon, Lisbon. yes, Lisbon. <laughs> OK. Yeah, this is Gar Gar Oriente, And this is inspired by basically these zoomorphic forms, human-like forms or animal-like forms, whatever you think these could be. And this is the blue blueprint for the design. And it's a beautiful place, actually. I recently visited this uh, in, in December. Uh, actually, all of these are beautiful places. OK, so that's, uh, that's one of the principles, basically, zoomorphic architecture. I'm not going to go into the detail, but uh, we already discussed uh, that uh, something similar to this, right? And you can see examples of this. Some other examples that we have not looked at, actually. <laughs> OK, uh, so basically, what does this remind you of? It's, it's like a bird, right? Or some people, dinosaur, maybe, stegosaurus. It doesn't matter. It's still zoomorphic. <laughs> it's close enough. So there's some approximation that's happening between this bird and that bird, right? OK, this is another place that I recently visited. Uh, I was just there, actually, over the weekend. I uh, gave a talk uh, on Monday. Anybody know what this is? Not anybody from there. <laughs> this is in Sevilla. It's Puente del Alamillo, 
What does it look like? I'm curious, what do you think here? Yes? Uh, art, music instrument. Music instrument, that's true, a little bit. What about you? Okay, <laughs> so it's more like a harp than what he intended for it to look like, <laughs> which is probably true actually, yes? Chest part of, of, of a bird, yeah. of a human. Okay, yeah, maybe. <laughs> what else? Any other guesses? You can exercise your yes. Uh, wing. Wing. Okay, which part? These or, uh, or everything. everything? Okay, yeah, yeah. Maybe that's more like what he intended. I don't know. Of course, it's open to interpretation, right? Any 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 other guesses? Huh? Bow. <laughs> Bow. Okay, yeah. If you look at it this way, yeah. Okay, sure. That's good. <laughs> I think according to him, uh, this was supposed to be like a pigeon. <laughs> you know, this is the head, <laughs> that's the eye, and that's the beak a little bit, I guess, right? That's my interpretation of it. A pigeon that's looking backwards like this, maybe, <laughs> right? <laughs> that's at least his zoomorphic design, right? But of course, you could, uh, you could think that it resembles something else, clearly. <laughs> okay. Mm. Okay, so uh, on, on principles a little bit more. This is the quote from Frank Lloyd Wright. Frank Lloyd Wright uh, possessed very similar uh, properties, I think, uh, as uh, Calatrava. Uh, he was very hard-headed on principles, uh, which is, I think, a very good thing. He, and he drove his principle. Basically, he said architecture uh, should be based upon principle and not upon precedent. Precedent means what comes before. You should really not base things just, uh, just on what comes before. And if he did that, he could have designed something like this. This is what comes before, right? You could find it. It's functional. It's not bad, I think. I don't mind living there, maybe. <laughs> Depends on where it is. Uh, but instead, he designed uh, like this based on some principle, right? By the way, this doesn't mean that it's not principle. This may have some other principle, but maybe it's not the principle that, uh, that is better fit for his purposes, right? OK, so his principle was organic architecture. It is a philosophy of architecture which promotes harmony between human habitation and the natural world through design approaches so sympathetic and well integrated with its site that buildings, furnishings, and surroundings become part of a unified, interrelated composition. That's exactly what falling water is, actually. Uh, and it's a beautiful picture. There are more beautiful pictures. Even during the winter, it's even more beautiful, I think. OK, so what is this all about? Basically, I've given you a bunch of architecture stuff, but we talked about principles, metrics, mindset. All important things. And I think this is really critical for this sort of course. Being a computer architect is all about those, I think, uh, doing the trade-offs. So I think we would like to understand the principles. That's one of the major high-level goals of this course. Uh, understand the precedents, so we'll look back also. Uh, and based on such understanding, uh, hopefully, uh, you will be enabled to evaluate trade-offs of different designs and ideas. This will happen through the labs also. Uh, and hopefully you'll be able to develop principle designs or maybe discover new principles, right? It's not clear if we have all the principles to design computing architectures for the future today. In fact, I'll, to I'll tell you a little bit in a, in a little bit. We, the field is at a flux right now. It, it's, it's, it's at a point where you can actually disrupt a lot of things by developing new principles or new designs. And hopefully you can develop novel out-of-the-box designs. So the focus is on principles, precedents, and how to use them for new designs in computer architecture, of course. By the way, how many of you have taken my digital circuits course? Show of hands. Let's see, one, two, three. Only three, or four maybe, yeah. Okay, so actually digital circuits course is all about that also, but it's kind of the beginning of it. I'm gonna say that, uh, I'm gonna to reference to that earlier. We're, gonna, we're not going to overlap a lot with that course. This is the next in sequence. But if you're, uh, that's more basic. How many of you have taken a computer architecture course before? Okay. How many, uh, how many of you have taken uh, a digital logic design course? Not from me, necessarily. Okay, more. Okay, that's good. How many of you are in, yes, computer science? Okay, what about EE? Okay, that's a good mix. That's exactly, I've, from my perspective, CS and EE are a continuum, basically. There's no difference. I was, I was teaching in the in EE department before. I got my degree in CE, computer engineering, whole degrees. <laughs> and then now I'm teaching in CS, but I'm always in both departments. So it's, it's good to, and you're going to see that in this course also. What about, uh, how many of you are bachelor students? Okay. What about masters? Okay. What about PhD? 
Okay, no one, no one <laughs> there yet. <laughs> Maybe he'll decide to a PhD, who knows? <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, so basically we're going to talk about, uh, you, you've seen some of this, if you've taken my course, which is really the minority at this point over here, you've seen some of this in that course, but we're going to take it to the next level. Okay, so uh, this is uh, my PhD advisor, Yale Pat. Uh, he's uh, a famous guy and uh, he's done a lot of work on computer architecture and this is the role of the architect according to him. I'm going to expand this uh, a little bit, you know, but basically you need to look everywhere. <laughs> you need to have eyes everywhere basically as an architect. So that pigeon is probably a good thing. <laughs> uh, you need to look backward, forward, up, and down. Uh, and I mean, he says some things over here, but uh, let's take a look at it in a little bit more detail in my paraphrasing of it. Basically, you need to backward. You need to understand the past really well so that you don't repeat the mistakes of the future, uh, mistakes toward the future, and also understand the past so that you can combine things better, right? You can understand the trade-offs and designs, upsides and downsides, past workloads, uh, basically analyze and evaluate the past. And this is a really important skill to have for an architect. You could, uh, it's good to do it uh, both from uh, a qualitative perspective. You look at a design and you can evaluate it qualitatively without doing any experiments on it. But it's also very important to do it from a quantitative perspective by doing experiments on that design, right? For example, take a workload, you simulate it, uh, you, you basically analyze the workload, how many loads, how many stores, that, that, that. these are very basic things, of course. How would it behave if you had this sort of design or that sort of design? Basically, analyzing and understanding the past is really important, both qualitatively and quantitatively. And this course will cover some of that, but keep this in mind all the time. You should be able to do this very well qualitatively. Qualitatively meaning by looking at this microphone, you say that comparing to this microphone, the design constraints are different, right? Who wants to carry this? <laughs> I don't know. I don't like this one, but I guess that could have been a solution to our problem. <laughs> so I guess thinking the solution, when you have the solution at hand is also another thing. <laughs> I think this is working though, hopefully. Uh, okay, uh, looking forward uh, is basically forward to the future. You, you need to be a dreamer and create new designs or listen to the dreamers, right? Because if you're stuck in the past, you will never go forward. Uh, there is a, uh, this is very actually a very constant debate in architecture. Usually there are some people who says, we built the best architecture we can. Why are we working on it still? <laughs> I've seen this many, many times actually. I've seen this in case of when you submit a paper, you get reviews. People say, we built the best random number generator, generator we can in the world. Why do you want to make it even higher throughput or lower cost or whatever? Right. We actually received some review with that same spirit very recently and they, the, the paper was rejected. This mentality is out there, it exists. <laughs> but that's not good because that uh, essentially doesn't enable a better future, right? So an architect is really a dreamer and also a supporter of the dreamers. You can support people uh, who have new applications in mind or they may have some notion of an application in mind but they, they don't know what it is. And by creating new designs, by dreaming about new designs and enabling them, you can enable new things. Like who would have guessed that we would have self-driving cars 50 years ago, right? Of course, some people are dreamers, they guess, right? Jules Verne is an example of those dreamers, right? He wrote a, a lot of books. There are many, many other people. But those dreamers are actually the creators of the future, not the ones who says, oh, this architecture is good enough. <laughs> so I, I actually give this example in Digital Circus course, if, you, if some of you remember. Uh, when people design MIPS R2000, this is an in-order processor, single issue, Reasonably high frequency at the time. Uh, a lot of things are managed by the compiler, uh, so it's relatively efficient. They said, this is good enough. Why do we want a better performing processor <laughs> than that? Of course, right now we're at much higher performance processors. MIPS R2000 is something extremely simple. It doesn't even go into the microcontrollers today. <laughs> this thing is extremely powerful today. So if we, if, we, if we were stuck with MIPS R2000, this thing wouldn't have been possible basically. And forget about other big things like climate modeling or some, some huge uh, complex problem that you need to solve or modeling the brain or molecular dynamic simulations, whatever you want to think about. Machine learning, right? Machine learning, forget, machine learning wouldn't have been possible with MIPS R2000. Okay, so you got to be the dreamer and create new designs. That's the point here. So I have another reliability problem as you can see, but I don't know where it is. Oh, well, I know where it is. ETH wants me to log into the public network. Okay. Uh, okay, basically you need to push the state of the art and evaluate new design choices. That's how you can uh, become, uh, enable the future. Looking down, uh, oh wait, look, look up, yeah. 
uh, looking up is uh, up in the computing stack. So we have this transformation hierarchy. I think I'll have it later in the uh, um, in one of the slides. And if you took digital circuits, you know that it always starts with problems, and eventually you go all, uh, all the way down to electrons. And looking up means looking up toward the problems. Basically, what are the problems? Understand the important problems and their nature. Machine learning, for example, or important problems in an, uh, bioinformatics or genomics, right? Understand them and their nature so that you can develop architectures and ideas to solve those important problems. This is a really important function of the architect. Now, there are multiple approaches to this. Uh, architecture actually is very, very heterogeneous. Uh, so there are general purpose architectures that try to solve all of the problems in a good enough way. For example, Intel and AMD have been developing these architectures for a long time, right? It's very general purpose. It can execute anything. It cannot execute anything at the highest efficiency, but it can execute anything at reasonable efficiency, right? It's not the best for that particular application, but it's good enough. So that's a general purpose architecture. Even there, it's important to understand the problems because you need to get the good enough performance across many, many workloads, right? But today, we're, we're well past beyond, beyond that general purpose design because energy efficiency and complexity of the systems are forcing us really to specialize the com uh, computations that we do, specialize the architectures to the application that's running, either dynamically or statically from the beginning or put some primitives into the architecture such that these applications can exploit it because that's the only way to achieve power efficiency today. That general purpose mindset is good but even if you look at Intel and AMD, they specialize uh, parts of their processors such that some of these really important applications can execute fast. One example, actually this is not, this is not a new trend, this is an old trend. So how many of you know about AVX extensions, advanced vector extensions or SSE, SIMD? Yeah. Those are actually there for image processing, video processing. Intel in 1995 decided, this was actually a big debate uh, at Intel uh, because uh, they, this was an important application domain at that time, and clearly uh, it's very parallel. Uh, you, you do many operations with a single instruction. You do the same thing across an entire image, let's say, or a video. Video is a collection of images. And doing it with single instruction every time is very inefficient, right? But what if a single instruction specified many, many operations, a million operations at the same time? That enables you much higher efficiency and much higher performance. Now, the big debate at Intel was, why should we do this or should we not do this? And there were proponents saying that, okay, we don't have exact data, but if we do it, applications will adapt to it and people will start using this. At the time, it was called the MMX, Multimedia Extensions Technology. And oh, gladly they won, as opposed to people who did not want to do it because they needed more evidence that applications would actually really use it. So sometimes you need to take a leap as an architect. You have to have good uh, view and say, okay, their applications are going to use it. So I don't have enough evidence for this because I cannot, I'm not going to go and modify all of the applications in the world. That's a lot of work and take advantage of it and simulate and show. Sometimes you may not be able to do that. But clearly, if you know the application space really well, if you know the trends really well, if you know the requirements really well, you can make that leap as an architect and actually get ahead of the game, right? If Intel was deciding 10 years later, <laughs> if, 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 if they should put an MMX engine inside, they would be late. Okay, so it's important to understand problems and their nature. Today, there are other applications, machine learning, genomics, and there may be other applications also. Looking down is also important because looking down uh, keeps you honest in a sense. It keeps you uh, implementable, right? Because you can only do so many things downstairs, if you will. Downstairs meaning device and circuit technology. Uh, Okay, I'll fix this during the break. Basically, understand the cap capabilities of the underlying technology, devices. CMOS technology is one technology, for example. Is your memory volatile or, volatile or non volatile? There are different technologies. A substrate is very different, right? If your substrate was biological, for example, if you had cells to program, that would be a very different substrate, and the capabilities would be very different in that case. Uh, okay. So this is really important, and we're going to talk about this also. And predicting and adapting to the future of the technology is also important uh, because you're designing for n years ahead. Now, design cycles have reduced uh, these days with some of the designs, but if you're really designing something big, usually it's not going to be in the market until n years, and maybe one, two, three, sometimes five, if you're really architecting something from scratch. 
So you really need to hit that point n years ahead because technology is changing. If you actually target today's technology, that's not good, right? But n years ahead, maybe you have non-volatile memory. And if you've designed based on that, based, if you have on-chip non-volatile memory, their design should be perhaps very, very different compared to current technology that says, oh, everything is volatile. Whenever you power it off, it, everything goes away. But that's a very different technology from whenever you power it off, everything stays. Right? So it's good to predict and understand the technology. That's why an architect needs to have eyes everywhere in their head. <laughs> So takeaway, I think being an architect is not easy. Uh, you need to consider many things in designing a new system, and plus have good intuition, insight into ideas, trade-offs, problems, uh, applications. But I think it's extremely fun. That's why I, I am an architect. And it can be very, very rewarding, because you get to solve real problems. And it enables a great future, I think, uh, in general. I think sustainability is a huge problem, for example, today. Uh, and for example, many scientific and everyday life innovations would not have been possible without the architectural innovations that enabled very high performance systems. There's many, many innovations that enabled them, but architectural innovation was at the center of it also. Mobile phones, for example, that's, that's actually one of the nice pieces of architecture that we have today. Maybe not the best, because you could imagine always better, right? If you're the dreamer, this is not nice. <laughs> but if you go back 20 years ago, some dreamers enabled this. Uh, Self-driving vehicles, people are trying to enable it, and there are many, many more things over here. Hopefully, this course will enable you to become a good computer architect if we, uh, if we do it well. So OK, I hope you're here for this. I'm going to take a break soon. Uh, but let's finish this little introductory part. Basically, hopefully, you've taken some sort of programming course. I assume so. Everybody knows C here? How, uh, how about Java? OK, that's good. That's a good overlap. Uh, how about Python? OK. Oh, you guys are good. <laughs> How about C++? OK. <laughs> Everybody keeps their hands up. I'll have to find it. How about Eiffel? Oh, OK. You guys, <laughs> you guys have taken the Eiffel course? <laughs> OK, good. That's good. I don't think, that, I don't think we would have, we would have uh, that many people uh, answering that question, yes, if I were, t I were at CMU right now. <laughs> OK, if you don't know Eiffel, you can learn about Eiffel. That's, <laughs> that's the beauty of <laughs> uh, being here right now. OK, basically, you, you know about pro programming. And we've seen programming. You've probably at some point seen programming as a model of computation. right? You write a program, it's really computation in the end. And that's the programmer's view of how a computer system works. If you don't know anything underneath, you write this program, and magically things happen. Right? Hopefully, you know something underneath, of course. Hopefully, you have had, actually, most of you had at least a digital design course in a computer architecture course. Here we saw digital logic as a model of computation. Basically, you don't have programs, but digital logic does the computation. Right? And there are principles for it. It obeys, based, uh, well, at least the existing systems are based on Boolean algebra. Uh, and this is the hardware designer's view of how a computer system works, uh, how, how, computer, how a computer system works. So what happens in between is what we've covered in, uh, in the digital circuits course, but we're going to cover a lot more in this course. Basically, how does an assembly program end up executing as digital logic? And how is a computer designed using logic gates and wires to satisfy specific goals? So basically, that's, uh, of course, you've seen some of this in, uh, in previous courses, but we're going to do more and more. I think this is the part we're going to focus more on over here. We have the architect or microarchitect's view, how to design a computer system that meets system design goals. And because the choices you make over here critically affect both who is sitting up and who is sitting down, the software programmer and the hardware designer. And something I don't show something over here, which is the user over here, right? Because user, at some, after some point, interacts with this design. So that's really important also. So we're going to talk a lot about those choices. Uh, let's take a break right now. <laughs> what do you think? And that, this is a good point to. Uh, uh, stop and then let's take a 10 minute break and then we'll continue. Does that sound good? Okay. Okay, let's get started. Is this a good enough break? 10 minutes? Or should we make it 15? We have a lot of flexibility in this course since it's a master level, master's level course and three hours chunks, as you know. So feel free to ask questions during the class also. There is no real scheduled material. We can cover a lot of in interesting things. Of course, there are things that I am biased to cover. 
because I enjoy covering them. <laughs> but there are some, if, you, if you have questions, feel free to ask during the course also. And so that's the difference from a bachelor's level course here. OK, uh, so okay, I already said this just to jog your memory. We're here. Basically, levels of transformation is critical. I alluded to it earlier. And if you've taken digital circuits, you've seen it. This is a quote uh, that I really love from uh, Richard Hamming. How many of you know of him, the name? Hamming, right, Hamming distance, yes. Actually, he's really the father of error correcting codes also because of his work in Hamming distance. Uh, and this is him with his cat, <laughs> as a cat lover. Uh, basically, the purpose of computing is to gain insight. That's really the whole purpose. It's really not number crunching or generating some random numbers or numbers at all. It's really making sense of those numbers. Uh, initially, a lot of computers were built for number crunching, but it was for making sense of them. And we generate, we gain and generate insight by solving problems, right? So the key question is how do we ensure problems are solved by electrons? That's the levels of transformation or the transformation hierarchy, or some people call it the computing stack, if you will. But they're referring to this thing. Uh, you start with a problem, and in the end, you've got to communicate with the electrons to get your problem solved. Clearly, we don't yet know how to speak language of electrons as humans, but maybe with brain-computer interfaces, we'll get there also. We don't know at this point. These interfaces may change, basically, with new technologies. But at this point, in the general purpose stack, that problem needs to get translated to an algorithm. Uh, an al algorithm, which you probably know by now, you how many of you have taken uh, an algorithms course? OK, that's good, yeah, that's good. So algorithms is important, but an algorithm is a step-by-step -step procedure that is guaranteed to terminate. It has this property of finiteness that's guaranteed to terminate. Uh, and where each step is precisely stated, each step is definite, uh, so you can actually execute each step alone. And each step is effectively computable, meaning it could be carried out by a Turing machine or a computer. right? That's essentially an algorithm, three properties of an algorithm. And there could be many algorithms that satisfy these criteria for the same problem, right? clearly. There are many sorting algorithms, for example. If you want to sort a given uh, array of numbers, you can employ many different things with different trade-offs. right? OK, algorithm gets translated into a program uh, and written in some language. And there are many languages also. And that gets executed on a runtime system. Uh, Operating system, memory manager, virtual memory, virtual machine. You, I assume you've taken a course on that also, operating systems. That's good. That's, how many of you have done that? Just to get an idea. OK, not everyone. It's required, right? Or no? I guess systems programming is kind of like operating systems. OK. It's good to know operating systems, of course. Uh, and ISA, basically things get translated into instructions. And this is the, it's at, at this point, we're at the hardware-software interface. That's why it became yellow over here. It's the contract between software and hardware, as we discussed. What the programmer assumes that the hardware will satisfy. It's a written contract, basically. You can put anything into it, but you've got to be able to satisfy it when you build the design. x86 is an ISA. And the ISAs keep evolving also. Uh, and then ISA gets implemented in the microarchitecture. That's basically an implementation of the ISA. x86 has many, many implementations. Uh, I don't know what, it, what the latest one is called. I think Cabby Lake, Coffee Lake. That's Intel's latest processors, right? Maybe there's something else that's new. It doesn't matter. The key is it's another microarchitecture with different features. It's important, but it's, it does, uh, basically it's another microarchitecture. And microarchitecture is designed based on logic gates. Uh, and these are logic circuits building blocks. Uh, it could be gates, memories, dot, dot, dot. Uh, and uh, gates are built upon some devices, right? Uh, device could be, I don't know, some, some sort of transistor, for example. Or it could be different memory cells. So, and then that's, of course, uh, built based on the principles of electrons. So that's the computing stack, basically. So we're going to focus a lot on this area, but we're going to expand quite a bit also in this course. This is. Uh, uh, I should really expand that, but we're going we're to look a lot into this area as well, especially algorithms sometimes. Uh, like we're going to look at graph processing uh, acceleration a little bit, but we're not going to go into a lot of detail uh, in these areas. So this is really architecture and microarchitecture. So an aside, I, I discussed, I think I can now take this, but OK. It's more stable. <laughs> OK, this is just an aside. If you're really interested, uh, it's good to be curious 
uh, in general, not just as an architect, but in general, if you want to make the best out of life. Uh, now it's working, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, it's good to know some of these. This is a seminal work that Hamming wrote, uh, Error Detecting and Error Correcting Codes. Uh, it talks about ECC, basically. It introduced the concept of Hamming distance at that time. Does everybody know what Hamming distance is? Not everyone? Don't be shy. I think everyone knows, right? Okay, not everyone knows. Basically, basically it's the number of locations in which two strings or two uh, equal length strings are different. That's it. <laughs> You compare, I don't know, let's say a cat, C-A-T, and bag. These are two equal length strings. And if your symbols are the symbols of the alphabet, their Hamming distance is two, right? Because they C uh, and B don't match, A and A match, uh, T and G don't match. That's the idea. Well, of course, it only works with equal length strings in this case. But this enables you to uh, correct errors, for example. If your Hamming distance is one, that means you have one error in the uh, strings and you could actually design code that, that are capable of correcting one error. You could do four, two errors, three errors, dot, 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 and it becomes more expensive as you keep increasing the number of errors that you can correct. And that's, uh, this work actually developed a theory of code that is used for error detection and correction. And it's very interesting. Of course, it's really early. Today, we employ many, many sophisticated error correction and detecting, detection methods, especially in memory and storage systems. Uh, in flash memories, for example, in solid state drives, they're very, very sophisticated, even more sophisticated error, code, uh, error codes than this. Because memories are not reliable, whenever you manufacture them, they may have errors. While during operation, they may get errors, and we're gonna talk about some of them. So you need some mechanisms to uh, fix those errors. Okay, this is also something else I would recommend, especially those of you who may want to do research in the future. This is a beautiful talk that Hamming gave. He, he spent most of his career at Bell Labs, which was a powerhouse in research uh, in the United States for a long time. Uh, and uh, after some time, he gave this talk over there, uh, reflecting on his experiences in research. And this is transcripted online. I would re definitely recommend that you take a look because it's, it has a really nice mindset on how to be a great researcher. Okay, so let me go back to the levels of transformation after that aside. So levels of transformation, we could deconstruct that also, right? Uh, nobody said that it's problems and algorithms in a linear fashion, but actually you interact a lot with the user also, so maybe you should think about it differently. Uh, that's important, I think. Maybe the entire stack should be optimized for the user. So this is a different view. And also, if you look at some different types of architectures, this levels of transformation may not, may be collapsed a little bit, or you may not even have the ISA in some cases, right? For example, if you're programming an FPGA, field programmable gate array, the interface you have is definitely not an ISA interface. That's why programming them is hard today, because you have to go through some other interface. You need to map your program directly to logic, right? How do you do that? Well, you may have some tools that go through it, but clearly there is no defined hardware software interface. Or you can think of your hardware software interface as really the logic level at that point, whatever PGA exposes you to, but there are no instructions. Right? So this interfaces could be different for different devices or different platforms uh, that we have. This is more the general purpose computing stack. If you try to specialize, now it becomes a little bit different. Okay, so actually when I talk with people at Xilinx, and when I show this picture, uh, they never like this part, <laughs> because they don't have it. And they want to get rid of it also for their company to be successful, right? Uh, and it's, it's fun to discuss. And that's true, actually, that it, nobody said that there should be instructions over there. You can directly program the logic as, we, as people are doing. And this is becoming more and more important, uh, because you could achieve much more efficiency if you directly map your program onto a substrate uh, uh, that, uh, you, because you don't need to go through executing these instructions and go through all of the baggage, if you will, of control uh, that you have to execute those instructions, right? And in fact, I think uh, the trends and systems are also going that way. Clearly, Intel, a general purpose company uh, which likes this, has bought Altera, which is the second biggest FPGA company in the world, reconfigurable logic company, and I think it makes sense for them because now they can be the general, general purpose as well as special purpose at the same time. So we're going to see much more, many uh, more special purpose architectures going into the future, and they don't necessarily obey this, these sort of interfaces. Okay, 
so why, why are these interfaces still interesting? Uh, basically, levels of transformation create abstractions, and abstraction is usually good. And abstraction enables, uh, what is abstraction basically? A higher level only needs to know about the interface to the slightly lower level, not how the lower level is implemented. Right? This is good, and if you have many, many of these, that abstraction can be easy because everybody can focus on whatever they are focusing on. Somebody can do the logic, somebody can do the microarchitecture, somebody else can do the ISA, somebody else can do whatever comes in the higher layers, right? That's nice. For example, high-level language programmer doesn't really need to know what the ISA is or how a computer executes instructions if somebody else does the next level. Uh, so abstraction is great for improving productivity because you don't need to worry about decisions made in the underlying levels. It improves programmability also. Actually, in the FPGA domain, the configurable domain, you don't have these abstractions really well defined. As a result, productivity is low. As a result, there are fewer people programming FPGAs because it's not easy, because you don't have this nicely defined abstractions, right? So we're just applying what we just discussed to this slide. This is great. Uh, for example, programming in Java is easier than programming in C, which is easier than programming in assembly, which is easier than programming in binary which is easier by specifying the control signals of what should happen every single cycle in your system, right? We have an abstraction at the higher levels, which is good. But why would you want to go uh, know what goes on underneath or above? Uh, I think if you've taken digital circuits, we've discussed this also. So as long as everything goes well, not knowing underneath is great. So ignorance is bliss in that case. <laughs> but life is not always that nice, unfortunately. Especially today, life is not that nice. Uh, maybe 20 years ago, okay, you could still write a program without knowing anything underneath, and you could still get good performance because hardware was improving extremely fast. Although, if you really wanted high efficiency and high performance, you would still, you should still know what's going on underneath and optimize your program, for example. So basically, if you have a problem, then if you don't know what's going on across the abstraction layers, you have you have a bigger problem, right? If you if the program you wrote is running much slowly, then it should than your goals. Well, if you don't know what, how to optimize your program, you're limited, right? If all you know is, oh, I can write adds, multiplies, but uh, don't know how to actually uh, fit your program into the caches such that you can maximize the performance, there's a problem, right? So that requires breaking the abstraction levels. What if the program you wrote does not run correctly? Maybe there's some problem at, at the under, underlying abstraction levels, right? What if it consumes too much energy? It's actually even harder. Performance is hard. But energy is even harder today because we don't even have good models at the programming layer uh, to understand how much energy we cost, right? This is something, it's a, it's a research area actually figuring out how to attribute energy costs to different ways of programming, different algorithms. Uh, what if your system just shut down and you have no idea why? What if this thing not, is not charging, for example? I have an abstraction level to this thing. Uh, it's supposed to work when I put it over there, but if it doesn't work, I have no idea what's going on underneath, right? Unfortunately. That's exactly the same problem. What if someone just compromised your system and you have no idea how that happened or how to fix it? Right? So clearly these are problems. What if the hardware you designed is too, uh, it goes the other way also. Basically, you, were, you're, you could be operating at the hardware level and you're designing something. Uh, but if you don't know what's happening upstream at the higher levels, you may actually design something that's too hard to program. And as a result, what you did could be useless. And this happened in the past. For example, people uh, have designed architectures that are not programmer friendly. They decided not to put cache coherence into uh, the architecture. Caches are not kept coherent. As, as, uh, it's the responsibility of the software programmer to keep it coherent. IBM cell architecture is my favorite. It's a nice architecture, but it's very hard to program, very hard to get high performance in unless you're an expert programmer who knows exactly how to manage the data. This was used in PlayStation, Sony PlayStation. Uh, but it's too hard to program. What if the hardware you designed is too slow because it doesn't provide the right primitives to the software? The software cannot, uh, for example, modify the caches for whatever reason uh, and manipulate it such that it can get high performance. And what if you just want to design a much more efficient and higher performance system? You don't, uh, maybe you don't have a problem, but you're, you have a goal. And your goal is much to design a much better system than what you have today. You really need to understand across those abstraction layers. And as I said, today there is no single uh, silver bullet at any of these layers. And I'm not going to go back to it because there is a lot of animation. You really need to know across the stack. Okay. 
So basically, that's one of the uh, goals of this course. There are two key goals, actually. We need to cross the abstraction layers. Uh, to be able to do that, you need to understand how a processor or a system works underneath the software layer and how decisions made in hardware affect the software and the programmer because every decision actually has some effect. It may be exposed, it may not be exposed. The ones that are exposed actually have much bigger effects. And also, I think it's important for an architect to be comfortable in making design and optimization decisions that cross the boundaries of different layers and system components. Clearly, the hardware-software interface, but also other parts as well. OK, so let's take a look at some examples of this. Any questions so far? I've been speaking a lot, but everybody's awake so far, so that's good. That's a good sign. <laughs> Okay, no questions. So let's talk about some examples of crossing these abstraction layers. We're going to go into more detail in some of these topics, but I want to give you a survey, and we, we can go into more detail right now also. So multi-core systems, this is an old multi-core system from 2005 or so, 2006. Uh, basically, these are multiple cores, right? Multiple processing units. Uh, and there is a cache hierarchy. In this case, you have these L2 caches. You have a shared L3 cache. These L2 caches are private to the cores. That's it. That, even that's a design choice clearly, when you're designing the architecture. At that time, these folks at AMD made this design choice. And you have a shared memory controller over here. And then you have a huge DRAM interface. It's amazing how much space this thing occupies as the analog to digital uh, interface, well, and digital to analog interface, and uh, the DRAM. And actually, if you look at the system, this, you, can see, you can already see that that may be a bottleneck, right? Even though I made it up over here with an arrow. <laughs> That's actually a bottleneck in today's systems because if you actually, if these caches are not very effective, you're always trying to get data from memory into the cores and that is really limiting you. We're gonna talk a lot about that bottleneck because that's one of the major bottlenecks that we have today because of this way of designing the system. So if you take a look at this from an architecture perspective and understand the applications, you would say there's a problem here. And that problem is there because of the mindset in which we've been designing computers for a long time. Everything gets processed in the processors or the cores over here. Actually, if you look at the cores, the computation units, I don't know exactly where they are over here, but these are caches, as you can see, right? They're very regular. They're not computation units. But some of these units over here are computation units, I bet. They're much smaller, right? Most of the space in this system is occupied by caches, interconnect, memory controllers, other caches, interconnect, interfaces to get the data, other interconnect, memory, and then if you go out to the storage system, other interconnect, other storage. So my point is, computation is very little in a system that we design. It's just whatever is constrained may be here. Everything else is dedicated for data movement and storage. So we're going to get back to that. So think about that mindset. Right? And some mindset brought us over here, clearly. OK, uh, so that's the importance of data. So OK, let's talk about multi-core. The multi-core has been around for a while now. Basically, In the past, this was not the case. right? In the past, you had a single core over here. But we had many, many more transistors than we could use. So people started putting multiple cores because it was difficult to increase the power or computational power of a core because of power constraints and complexity constraints. As a result, this is an old slide that I prepared in 2007, I think. Uh, as a result, people started adding these cores. Uh, and I think somebody on the online lecture said, oh, this is not eight, this is actually six. And they're right, there are six cores in the picture. <laughs> I say eight cores over here. But Intel Core i7 is really a family, so I should really correct this to be six. Uh, but it's really a family, so I think right now they may have 24 cores or something. Anybody know? <laughs> um, yeah? Eight cores. Eight cores only? Yeah. Oh, okay, I see. They didn't add more? OK, maybe I have the last generation over here. So we can discuss why they didn't add more, because maybe they're bottlenecked by memory. <laughs> if they add more, they're not going to get much more performance, because memory bandwidth will be saturated. OK, that's a good point. So I'll, maybe I'll keep eight cores, but change this picture. <laughs> OK, so why, why have people moved uh, to uh, uh, multi-core? Because it's simpler and lower, a single core is simpler and lower power than a single large core. Uh, we may talk about this more, but if you've taken digital circuits, you know the complexity that goes into building a very single large core, the out of order execution units, uh, all the memory dependency checking that you need to do to speed up a program, single threaded program. If you parallelize your program and get performance, it's much easier and much nicer, of course. 
Of course, there's fundamental. You may not be able to parallelize it. We're going to talk about heterogeneity in the future. Uh, this is a cell that I mentioned. As you can see, there are eight cores over here and one service core, if you're a control processor. Uh, it's a bit heterog heterogeneous in this case. And I'm not going to go into the details of it, but there are many, many cores. So the benefit of this is you get parallel processing on a single chip. If you can parallelize your program, you, get, you can get faster applications, you can enable new applications, and you can do it energy efficiently. Because a single core consumes a lot of energy, but with many cores, maybe you don't need as much power in each core. You can reduce its, the energy of each core, but you can parallelize your program and get the same performance, perhaps, at much better efficiency. Okay, so ideally what you want is if you uh, have n, uh, if you increase the core, uh, core uh, number of cores by n times, you want to increase, you want the performance to increase by n times, right? That's linear scaling. If you want this to be 2n with n times the cores, then that's, there's usually some cheating involved in it. <laughs> that's super linear scaling. So super linear is, usually you should question. Whenever you see a super linear increase in performance, you should always question what's happening here. It should not happen. You're, either add, you're probably adding more resources into the system or not making the right comparison. Your baseline is wrong. Uh, okay, so what do we get today? Uh, we should at least get linear scaling, in my opinion, for this to be scalable into the future. What do we get today is not as close. So this is an example. I'm gonna give you uh, some of the research that we've done. Uh, this, is, this was done in 2006, published in 2007. But basically, this was Intel's multi-core systems at, this at the time. Uh, you run one application, MATLAB, some of you may know it, GCC, some of you may also know it. Uh, run, run both of them together on two cores and measure how much each of them slows down compared to when it's run alone on the same system. Okay? So MATLAB uh, slows down by 7%, GCC slows down by 3x. So basically they're interfering with each other, that's the real cause, there's a reason. Uh, because when they run together, they're interfering with each other. As a result, both of them are slowing down, but one of them is slowing down much more than the other one. And if you actually, if you actually do the calculation, uh, in the end, uh, you don't increase the performance significantly. You, uh, you, don't, you don't get 2x uh, when you double the number of cores because of this reason. Okay, so you go try and fix the problem. You assign MATLAB to be low priority at the operating system the op to tell the operating system, nice, this. You know the nice command in Linux? Yeah. Uh, and then you tell the operating system GCC is high priority. Nothing happens. You get the same result. <laughs> because you have only two cores in the system and two applications. An operating system doesn't take into account the priorities because it says, oh, this core is empty. I just schedule this application. And when I schedule this application, it's not aware of this thing that's happening underneath uh, that these applications are interfering somehow. So we call this the memory performance hog. Uh, at that time, and I believe it's a security problem, but it's also a performance and quality of service problem. It's broader than a security problem, actually. Uh, and the question that I have is, if you don't know what's happening underneath, can you figure out why the application slowed down? Hopefully the answer is no. <laughs> uh, can you figure out why there's a disparity in slowdowns if you do not know how the system executes the programs? And again, hopefully the answer is no. Can you fix the problem without knowing what's happening underneath? Again, the, problem, the answer should probably no, because you just observe and you get these performance numbers. And if you don't know what's happening underneath, if you don't know how the system is designed, if, you don't, if you're not even aware that there's a cache or a memory control that's shared between them, you cannot solve the problem. Right? So that's why crossing the abstraction layers is critical. Uh, okay, basically the rephrased, why is there any slowdown? Why is there a disparity in slowdowns? These are two different questions. Uh, how can we solve the problem if we do not want that disparity in the slowdowns? Or how can we solve the problem if we do not want any slowdown? That's a fourth question over here that I didn't ask, right? Okay, so why is this important? Let's go back because somebody can say, oh, I don't care, right? <laughs> I don't care if this is happening. Usually people care. Uh, but basically it's important because there's a higher level design goal that someone is trying to achieve. We want to execute applications in parallel and multi-core system. And you want to consolidate more and more for efficiency. And the interference is happening. I'm going to get into the interference more, but interference between these applications is happening because they're running together. And we want to keep this. We don't want to design multi-core systems and execute only one application. That would get rid of the slowdown. That's one solution, for example, right? Uh, but that's probably very inefficient. 
so this is happening in cloud computing, mobile phones. People are actually trying to consolidate. There's a lot of processing that's going into the cars now, and they want, people want to consolidate that processing in a single place or multiple networked places. So you can, you can think of uh, consolidation in an automotive system also. And we want to mix different types of applications together uh, because that improves our efficiency. Some of them will require quality of service guarantees, video, pedestrian detection, that could be very, very important in a self-driving car. Some of these machine learning algorithms that you need to learn quickly and then act quickly, those are actually quality of service critical. And there are others that are, less impor that are important, but less so. Uh, and there are others that are not even important, right? Maybe you don't want to run your wires checker when you're trying to uh, detect a pedestrian. <laughs> And you don't want to miss that pedestrian, right, while you're driving. Uh, OK, so basically, this is important because we want the system to be controllable and high performance at the same time. Uh, OK, well, let's go into the detail as to why we're getting the slowdown. Uh, maybe. So basically, this was the system that we were examining at that time. This is 2006. I think Intel, was it? It's amazing that I forgot. I had the retention problem in memory over here. I think it was Intel Core 2 Duo or, or Core Duo. No, no, Intel Pentium D at that time, not even that. This was Intel Pentium D. Intel designed these systems where uh, they essentially put two copies of Pentium uh, um, and, mm, or Pentium 4, uh, and it looked like this, basically. So th these, uh, these had private caches, the cores. There was some shared interconnect and shared memory controller and shared memory. So DRAM was shared. And if you run MATLAB and GCC, this is what happened. MATLAB would generate a lot of requests. They would occupy the banks. GCC would generate requests once in a while. And MATLAB kept occupying the DRAM banks because it was a memory performance hog. Right? And the fundamental problem is really this thing over here that was controlling access to memory is unfair. Because yes, MATLAB may be generating a lot of requests, sure, GCC once in a while. Uh, but if you actually care about the fairness across these workloads, you should not prioritize MATLAB most of the time, right? That's the idea. So fundamentally, the algorithms that are employed in the memory controller is unfair. So this problem could also happen in the cache, for example. In this case, the caches were not uh, shared, but if, a, if you had a shared cache, a similar thing could happen, right? MATLAB could be a streaming application that's accessing a lot of data, could be generating a lot of requests and bringing them into the cache and kicking out cache blocks of another application that may have very, very good locality. Right. In this case, that was not the cause, but the same thing can happen in some other shared resource. It could happen in the interconnect in more subtle ways. OK, so uh, let's dig a little bit deeper. Now the next question is, OK, maybe there's some unfairness. We pinpointed the unfairness. Now how do we, how do we really understand why is this unfairness happening? You could always peel the onion more and get to the heart of it, right? Uh, okay, so let's dig deeper. If you look at, wh why is the memory controller designed this way? Why is the memory controller prioritizing uh, MATLAB uh, over GCC? Let me give you one example. So if you know about the operation of DRAM bank, it looks like this. It has a two-dimensional array of cells. We're gonna cover a lot more of DRAM in this course. We're gonna focus a lot on memory because it's one of the biggest bottlenecks in systems today. And fundamentally, all memory looks the same, actually. Internally, you have some columns and rows, two-dimensional arrays. and if you look internally to this, it's actually a combination of two, smaller two-dimensional arrays. It's like snowflakes. When you look inside, you'll see another snowflake. <laughs> and you keep doing that. OK, but let's do this abstraction. This is an abstraction of columns and rows. Uh, yeah, I said this, I think, just now. Internally, a bank consists of many cells and other structures that enable access to the cells uh, in a hierarchical manner. And if you want to access a row or a cell, you first need to access an entire row, bring the row into the row buffer, and then access the column that you need from it. That's how it operates. In DRAM, there is a need for a large row buffer because whenever you activate an entire row, you bring, you basically destroy all of the cells. You need to sense them, uh, and the row buffer is essentially the sense amplifiers. Uh, you need to sense the value because the capacitors are really small inside the cells, and you need to amplify, figure out what they mean, one or zero, and then store them for a while. And also, when you actually figured out what they mean, you actually destroyed what's inside the cell. Because it's a charge-based memory. Whenever you access a capacitor, you drain the capacitor. And one function of the row buffer, or sense amplifiers, is to actually restore the charge. By amplifying the charge, you amplify it, and then 
you reconnect to the cell and you drive the charge back into the cell, whatever you sensed. We're going to go into more detail of that. So, but this exists fundamentally. This is a fundamental thing. You cannot get rid of it because this is necessary for correct operation of memory. Okay, initially, you don't, if you didn't access anything, this is empty. There is no row that is inside the row buffer. Uh, let's assume that we want to access row zero, column zero from the memory controller. First, you send row address zero. You need to decode the row and activate the corresponding row. Uh, that's what the DRAM chip does internally. It activates it. It takes time, of course, to do that. And the row buffer now stores, has sensed all of the row and stores the data. Now you can access it. Uh, to access it, you send the column address and say read from that column, for example, in this case zero. And this takes time because the DRAM chip internally gets that data, muxes it out, uh, figures out which one's the right one, and sends it back to the memory controller. Okay, so that's an access. Let's assume in the next uh, request, the memory controller wants to access row zero, column one. Now, it doesn't need to activate row zero again because row zero is already in the row buffer. That's the beauty. It's already activated. It's already sensed. It's already restored. It's inside there. You can directly access it. So it just needs to send the column address. This is called a row buffer hit. You can now, this is act, uh, acting as a cache, small cache internally, right? This is called a row buffer hit. So the memory controller sends column address one. And the only thing that needs to happen is that access, muxing out the data and sending it back to the DRAM chip. So the second access is much faster, right? Because the row is already open over here. The third access, to the same row, to column 85, same thing. It hits in the row buffer, memory control figures it out. So of course, memory control needs to keep track of what's in the row buffer, right? There needs to be some metadata in the memory controller, which is in hardware. So it sends the column address, gets the data. Now let's see what happens if the access to row one, column zero. Memory controller sees row zero is open, but we want to access row one, too bad. Now we need to prepare the bank for the access to row one, which means that well, we, we have a conflict over here. We cannot access the data from here. So we need to write it back. Writing it back is an abstraction, actually. You need to pre-charge the array. Pre-charging means prepare the bit lines over here for the next access. We're going to go into more detail of this. In this case, we don't show all of those bit lines over here, right? So that takes time, clearly, pre-charging the array. Now you need to access row, activate row address 1. You go through the row decoder, activate it, bring, which brings the data into the row buffer. And now you can finally send the column address to get column zero from row one. So clearly this row conflict access took a much longer time, right? It required, an act uh, it required a pre-charge, activate, and a read. Whereas if, you, if the data was already in the row buffer, if the row was already in the row buffer, it, you just required a read. No pre-charge, no activate. Okay, and DRAM controllers were designed consciously based on that. People knew that their all conflict memory access takes significantly longer than row hit access, and people designed controllers to take advantage of that fact. They basically use, uh, used a scheduling policy uh, that is published in this paper, but that was that is being used for a long time in the past. Uh, the, the idea is if you if you're ac if you're trying to access a bank, uh, and if uh, you have a queue of uh, you have a queue, and you have a bunch of requests, you first service the one that hits in the row buffer. You know what's in the row buffer. If there's a request that hits in the row buffer, you first service that one. That's the first priority level. Memory controllers are implemented, uh, are implemented as priority logic. Uh, and this is the highest priority, uh, ignoring everything else. Uh, that you, if you're interested, you can look at this patent, for example. And if everything is being equal, among, for example, if you have two row hit accesses, then you pick the older one. Right? That's the tiebreaker. And that's the idea. So clearly. Uh, this may make sense, right? If you're, if, if you're the only processor, if you only have one single processor in the system, this maximizes your DRAM throughput because you're, you're trying to take advantage of the row buffer as much as possible. If you're hitting, keep accessing it. That's great, and that also reduces your latency as well, uh, which is good. The problem is when people moved from single core to multi-core, they didn't think about the effects this could have on other applications from some other core. Now, if multiple applications share the DRAM controller, and if you design the DRAM controller to maximize DRAM data throughput, you can easily be unfair because you were trying to optimize for data throughput from the DRAM, and some applications naturally hit a lot in the row buffer, and those applications will be prioritized naturally. That's the idea. So row hit, there are actually two problems. One is the row hit first. It unfairly prioritizes applications that 
naturally hit a lot in the row buffer because once you open the row buffer, the memory controller will prioritize that application. Uh, threads that keep on accessing the same row. The second one also actually is a problem. Oldest first is not a fair policy, and this is very well known actually in networking. The first one is very specific to DRAM, but the second one is very well known in networking. Networking has a similar problem. Uh, if in a router, uh, if you have, have two flows, uh, how do you ensure that you're fair to both of the flows, right? If one flow, if, if you do oldest first prioritization, that's not good because one flow may be injecting lots of packets into that router. <laughs> And the router has a buffer, and it takes some time to service things. And that buffer uh, may be full for one flow. And the other flow, even though it has only one request, it doesn't get serviced because all of the things that this other flow filled the buffer with look older to the router. So basically, oldest first is not a good policy because if you're memory intensive, most of your requests appear older to the scheduler compared to some other uh, uh, applications requests. So there are two problems. Basically, as a result, the ARM controller is vulnerable to denial of service attacks or quality of service problems. You can write programs to exploit this unfairness. Is this clear? It's fun, right? <laughs> I love this because it was fun for us <laughs> when we first started looking at it. And then we, we said, oh, okay, we see it in real programs, so why don't we uh, write micro benchmarks to exploit it? This is a micro benchmark. This actually, we took the stream program that is used uh, it was developed by John McAlpin to measure uh, bandwidth uh, in systems. And people still use that program to measure maximum uh, bandwidth, memory bandwidth. We took it, we modified it a little bit. Uh, and if you look at the program, it looks like this. This is one part of the program, the stream copy. Uh, basically, you're copying one large array to, into another array, and you're streaming through that. Basically, every access you do is sequential. Location 0, location 1, location 2, dot, dot, dot in sequence. But we made sure that this program is extremely intensive. We didn't access uh, uh, at a word granularity, but we made sure that each access is to a different cache block, such that you don't, you miss in the caches. So caches are ineffective for this program. Okay, so sequential memory access, very high level for locality, about 96% hit rate, measured on real systems and memory intensive because we made sure it's memory intensive. Okay, so we want to tie the control application also, exactly the same characteristic, uh, characteristics, except it accesses uh, memory in a random manner. So how do you do that? Basically with this. <laughs> you need a good random number generator for this, for example. <laughs> Actually, this is uh, not correct. If you do this study like this, what happens is uh, this random number generation takes such a long time that this program becomes bound by compute or, or random number generation. So what you need to do to do this correctly is pre-initialize an array with the indices with, uh, with doing the random number generation and then access uh, those indices over here. Does that make sense? <laughs> Basically what we wanted to do is to have two programs that are similarly memory intensive, such that memory intensity is not a problem, but we wanted to look at the locality effects in the row buffer. Okay, so basically this, uh, what, what this does is you do the same thing, copy one array to another one, uh, but do it in a random access manner. As a result, you get very low row buffer locality, but you get similar memory intensity because you do this smartly. You generate the random numbers earlier, pre-initialize an array, and use them as indices over here. So let's see what happens when you actually run these two things together. Now conceptually, if you know what's going on underneath, you could simulate it in your head. And I'm gonna do that pictorially right now, right? And as an architect, it's always good to uh, not just measure, we're gonna measure afterwards, but it's also always good to hypothesize what's going to happen this way. In fact, we're constructing things because we have a hypothesis, right? Actually, we saw that result with MATLAB and GCC, and then we have a hypothesis. Oh, this is happening because of the two things, row, row hit first and oldest first problems. Oldest first, okay, let's eliminate that and let's look at the effect of the row buffer. So we're really hypothesizing. And now let's simulate in our heads what will happen. Assume that this is your memory request buffer. This is streaming application request, random application request. Assume that streaming application somehow opened the row it's going to access. What happens is it hits in the row buffer and then random application generates requests. Streaming application generates requests at the same rate. So at any given point in time, you expect the same number of requests over here, assuming they're, servicing, they're, getting, at the, they're getting serviced at the same rate also. But the arrival rate of the request from streaming and random into this queue should be the same, assuming they're similarly memory intensive. But memory controller would prioritize streaming one because our hypothesis is that the underlying memory controller tries to take advantage of the row buffer. 
which is true. As a result, this is what happens. Streaming application requests get prioritized because they keep hitting in the row buffer and random access application waits. Its core is basically doing nothing at that time. And at some point, it's not generating requests because it's done, right? It's full. It's stalled. OK. I think at some point, it's going to end. Yes. <laughs> and it ends when you're done with the row buffer in the streaming application. For example, if your row size is 8 kilobytes and your request size cache block size 64 bytes, you get about 128 requests of stream service before a single request of random access. Right. Not good. <laughs> and this is the cause of that huge disparity in slowdowns. Yes? Uh, would it help if you had a smaller request buffer so that it doesn't fill up? So uh, that's a great question. It would, yes. In, th in that case, you would limit the damage <laughs> because at some points, uh, you fill up the request buffer with random applications requests, and there's no streaming application request that could go in. But it has to be really small in that case. That's the downside. So it's a, it will become a very imbalanced, imbalanced system. So actually, uh, existing, a lot of the existing memory controllers have, uh, I mean, at that time, uh, had something that's really not, not so nice. <laughs> uh, which is basically, if a request has been waiting for 10,000 cycles or so, some threshold cycles, then schedule it. <laughs> it's like a hard stop. So it won't happen forever, even if your buffers uh, are, did not fill up. So it would stop at some point. But that's a very, not a, not a nice way. That's a very hard way of solving a problem. It doesn't give you good, good guarantees, good quality of service bounds. So you want some other solution uh, to the problem. OK, basically, that's the next question, right? Now that you understand what's going on, Actually, I don't have the data over here, but if you actually look at the results in, in some other presentation, in, in the paper, we definitely have the results. But if you look at stream versus random, I think stream slows down by 10% when it's run together with random, and random slows down by almost 3x, very similar to MATLAB and GCC. Uh, but we can analyze it much better because we know the program much better. <coughs> OK, how do you solve the problem, basically? What is the right place to solve the problem? Uh, first of all, yeah, you have a lot of choices. Should you punt the programmer? Probably not a good idea, right? <laughs> Actually, a programmer should not be dealing with this sort of stuff. System software, maybe, depending on what, uh, what the solution is, uh, if it has visibility, uh, and if it has control over this. For example, if it could map applications to different memory channels, it would get rid of that interference. If you had the luxury of having different memory channels and application, uh, few enough applications such that you could isolate. But of course, if you do that, if you have that solution, which we're going to talk about later in the course, now you're not utilizing your memory channels really well, right? You're partitioning two different applications. One of them going to, is going to this channel, the other is going to this channel. Now they're not interfering at all in, in DRAM. But what if this application requires more bandwidth? It cannot use this channel because you partition the channels. So there's a downside. Compiler, that's, that's not a good place because compiler has no idea about a different application, right? You cannot fix the problem. Actually, this is, you could have a, a good compiled application and it could lose performance because some other application is running and destroying uh, the assumptions that are made by the compiler. For example, the compiler, uh, not in this case, but compiler may assume uh, that you have this amount of cache in your system. And it, uh, it basically inserts prefetch instructions such that uh, you could prefetch into the cache. And it assumes some memory bandwidth, of course, when it, when, it, uh, when it inserts a prefetch instruction. It has no idea about the other application that could be scheduled into the system. It optimizes the program, optimizes the heck out of the program. When you run it, that pre those prefetches may be useless. And they may actually reduce your performance because there's some other application running and delaying those prefetches. Or prefetches are bringing data into the caches, but some other application is kicking out the data before it gets used by this application. So this is a problem that cannot be solved by the compiler. It has to be done by someone else because it's, it's really a performance isolation problem. You're not isolated. And the compiler is assuming that you're isolated. right? It, and it, it, it can have no knowledge of other applications. There's no compiler that I know of can compile many applications at the same time. OK, and cloud computing, you have no idea actually what those other applications are. Actually, I have no idea what's running in this, for example, even right now. <laughs> Many applications are running together. Maybe not right now, hopefully. Hopefully not right now, but when, I, when I'm using it. OK, hardware, memory controller, that sounds not bad, because it's really fundamentally it's caused by the unfairness in the algorithms that we baked into this hardware, right? We had an assumption 
a single core, in a single core system, we want to maximize data throughput, DRAM data throughput, and this algorithm is good enough. Actually, that's not always true also, that you can do better, in a, even in a single core system, which we will talk about. Uh, but it's not bad, at least. It's not destroying somebody else's performance. When you move to multi-core system, you should actually think about the algorithms in a different way. And your algorithm now needs to consider interference and other applications. So memory controller is a good place to solve the problem. DRAM, do you actually modify the DRAM chips? Uh, maybe not. People actually uh, propose some solutions, and I've seen that. Uh, why not add more row buffers into the DRAM chip? You could have, let's say, I don't know, let's say two row buffers. One is dedicated to this application, the other is dedicated to this application. Not bad, right? It gets rid of some of the interference. What is the downside of that? Yeah, exactly. So basically, uh, yeah, you may have two row buffers, but some application can get, can get benefit from both, right? That's right, yes. So if, the, uh, if, if, it, if one is not being used, it's not being utilized, you're saying. Yes, that's one problem. What else? You may also need a new controller now to manage how these two interact, and now that one is detached from uh, the DRAM controller, and mm -hmm. they may benefit interacting. Yeah, that's right. So you need, you need some more complexity in the controller, basically, the DRAM controller, or in the DRAM chip, that's right. That's right, if you, if, you, if you keep it only in the DRAM chip, yes, you may have a problem, you're right. What else? Yes? The DRAM is gonna cost much more for terabyte. That's right, yes, exactly. Now this is expensive, right? You have one more row buffer. Because the first one came free, right? You have to have the first one because it sends amplifiers. The second one, you don't really need to have it. It could be very expensive. What else, yes? Yes, yeah. the same cost, okay. More, more downsides, yes? If the software is optimized to use the second row buffer, it could, could still be a memory buffer. That's true, exactly, yes. <laughs> yeah, once you, once you have this DRAM chip software, designers will optimize using that, and if you take it away, yes, now you reduce performance of that program. Yeah, there are a lot of issues. Although it's good to have multiple row buffers, I think. <laughs> I think the real killer of this idea is the cost in the end, because it turns out row buffers are very costly in DRAM. It's, uh, uh, well, it won't solve this problem. It, it will not solve this problem, so this, it's a good idea, that doesn't solve this problem, but that enables you to get higher performance, I think, if you had multiple row buffers. Let me put it correctly that way. Uh, so everything you said is fine. Uh, it's not solving the problem. Uh, but if you, had, if, you, if you didn't have the cost constraint, you could put many, many row buffers, and that could act as a big cache inside DRAM, right? And somebody needs to manage it. Yes, complexity increases, but you could get better performance out of it. Uh, the downside is if you look at a row buffer, a single sense amplifier is, the size of a single sense amplifier is more than 100 times the size of a single DRAM cell. Because DRAM is optimized for capacity and cells are really, really small. So if you want to add another row, you're essentially, another row buffer, you're essentially either get, need to get rid of 100 rows, which is a lot of area, or you're costing more within the same area. Uh, basically, it's not a good idea in the end. <laughs> Okay, circuits, can you solve the problem with the circuits? I'm not sure, uh, okay, but you can think about it. Basically, two other goals of this course is to enable you to think critically, this is exactly what we did just now, and think broadly, because the solutions may span over here. Maybe there are some solutions to circuits that I cannot imagine right now, but the problem really stems from the hardware memory controller, and that could be solved in software if you have enough visibility into the memory mapping and allocation, if you can control it or in the memory controller. So I think the best parts are maybe system software and the memory controller over here. It's not clear if the other parts are the best solutions. So this is one potential reading for your homework one assignment, basically our paper from 2007, which was published in Usenix Security. Uh, and there's a lot more stuff that we're going to cover later. So we're going to do a paper reviews in this course, and this, this is one of the potential papers that you can review. Uh, so it's going to be fun. <laughs> And clearly there are solutions that we developed also. We just didn't stop at the problem. It's important to develop solutions, and we're gonna cover some of these later in the course. But the takeaway before we take a break is, 
uh, if we weren't able to break the abstraction layers between the components and the transformation hierarchy levels and didn't know what's underneath, we couldn't so understand or solve the problem. This is one example of a problem over here, actually. Uh, okay, another example we will start after 10 minutes or so. Okay, let's take a break. Okay, shall we get started? Any questions on, not this, but this? Is it interesting? Funny? Not so funny, I guess, when, <laughs> when, when your program gets delayed. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, let's take another example. I like these examples because they cut across the stack and refresh is a fascinating example. Uh, if you've taken digital circuits, you've seen some of this, but bear with me for a while. Uh, DRAM in the system, basically DRAM is over there, and it's an important component, uh, as we know. Uh, and there are many issues with it. Uh, we looked at latency issues related to its control. Uh, but let's take a look at some other issue, which is also interesting. So if you look at a DRAM cell, let's break the abstraction level a little bit more, see what's inside the cell. Remember the two-dimensional array? Essentially, that two-dimensional array consists of bit lines and word lines, and the bit line at the end gets connected to the sense amplifier, which is a row buffer. Uh, and the word line gets connected to the word line driver, which is a row decoder over here that I showed you. Uh, and a DRAM cell itself consists of a capacitor and an access transistor. And this is very fundamental to any type of memory. Uh, any type of memory needs to have a storage device. In, in DRAM's case, it's the capacitor, whether the capacitor is discharged or charged, encodes a zero or one. Uh, and it also needs to have an access device which is the access transistor in this case, and also the bit line and the sense amplifiers down there. Uh, so for any memory to work, you need both of them to work reliably. Uh, in DRAM, it doesn't work really reliably, actually, because it's, uh, based, uh, it's based on this charge storage inside the capacitor. And what happens is in capacitor, because you have an RC circuit, it leaks charge through that RC circuit, RC path, right? As a result, over time, you lose the charge that's inside the capacitor. So if you've charged it, after some time, it'll get discharged. How long does it take? Depends on the cell, depends on the characteristics of the circuit over here. Multiple things which we may discuss. Uh, but it's fundamentally unreliable, right? Unreliable meaning volatile in this case. It has a retention time problem which means that you need to refresh it, right? And you need to refresh all of the cells, actually, because there, there are many, many cells over here. A DRAM chip consists of tens of thousands of rows of such cells. This is one example of a row over here. It's controlled by the same word line. When you activate it, you open all of them at the same time. But they may leak charge uh, if, if you're not touching them, and they actually do. Okay, uh, so basically, the, the DRAM capacitor charge leaks over time. That's why it's volatile. And memory controller needs to, to, to keep, it, keep the data intact over there, the memory controller needs to refresh each row periodically to restore the charge. This is called a refresh. Essentially, it's an activate to each row every n milliseconds and a pre-charge so that you can activate the next row, right? So it's activate pre-charge pair. And typical n today is set to 64 milliseconds. Basically, every 64 milliseconds, every cell in DRAM is guaranteed to be refreshed by existing memory controllers. How is that typical end determined? It's determined based on some, many, it's, it's actually an interface between the memory controller and memory, DRAM chips. Every memory controller needs to obey that. Otherwise, they could be sued, actually, <laughs> because that's the interface. But why 64 milliseconds? Uh, because somebody decided that that 64 milliseconds covers most of the cells, uh, and they can make money out of it. They could give you a good yield. <laughs> because as you can see, if you go back over here, yes, this is very regular, but some cells may retain data for much longer because their RC constants may be different, right? But some cells can retain data for much shorter, actually. And we'll talk about that. But today, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the true retention time of a cell is. We refresh everything every 64 milliseconds. And this has some downsides. Clearly, each refresh consumes energy. You're doing it just to keep the data intact. It, each refresh degrades performance. The DRAM rank or bank is unavailable while it's being refreshed. It has some quality of service impacts. You may have long pause times while the bank is being refreshed, depending on your tolerance to uh, how long these refresh takes. 
And it turns out refresh rate limits DRAM capacity scaling. And we, when we first started looking at this problem, we did uh, some analysis uh, and studies. But this is for you to analyze. Uh, imagine how big the problem is. Imagine a system that has eight exabyte DRAM, 263 bytes. And an existing supercomputer is actually reaching very close to this. Uh, maybe it's not exactly there yet. We're in petabytes for sure. I'm not sure if we're in exabytes. I don't think we are yet. But we will be soon. <laughs> Uh, that's 2 to the 63 bytes. Uh, assume a row size of 8 kilobytes, 2 to the 13 bytes. I made it easy for you here. Eights cancel out. Uh, basically, how many rows are there? This is an easy question. That's 2 to the 50, right? How many refreshes happen in 64 milliseconds? Well, that's 2 to the 50, right? <laughs> that's a lot. And what is the total power consumption of DRAM refresh? If you do the study, well, you need to figure out what that is. You, know, you need to figure out how much uh, power a refresh consumes, and you will easily get to kilowatts in this case. Uh, and what is the total energy consumption of DRAM refresh during a day? That's going to be a lot. It's a good exercise. And what is it during the year, during the lifetime? It's a lot, actually. And you're just doing it to retain data inside memory. You're not even doing any computation, right? This power, from a technology perspective, it's wasted. Right? If you had a better technology that was non-volatile, this wouldn't be a problem. You may have other problems, but this wouldn't be a problem. OK, so that's, uh, that's the perspective. OK, you won't get any benefit but brownie points from me if you do it. Actually, this is an assignment that we give to digital, the digital circuit students. So some, of the, some people have already done it. But it's fun to do it, I think. OK, so we, uh, actually, this is another recommended paper, uh, Raider. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. But if you look at, if you do some projections, and you can read the paper for methodology. And you can always argue with any projection, of course. This is device capacity. And this is the percentage of time that you need to spend to refresh the entire device. If your DRAM device capacity is 4 gigabits, which is about today. Today, we're at 8 gigabits. You spend 8% of the time refreshing, which is basically lost the time refreshing. Lost time refreshing, right? It's not good. Even 0%, even 1% even is not good, probably. But if you actually, if the current trend continues, if the cells increase, if the number of rows increase, and if they become more leaky when they reduce in size, which are two trends, it turns out if you have a very large device, which is also a trend that we want, uh, because we want to have higher capacity memories, those have enabled bigger applications in many domains, uh, future DRAM chips could be spending about 46% of their times refreshing. That's a lot, yes? So do you also have to refresh the so that's a great question. I think now you're thinking critically. Uh, in most systems today, yes. <laughs> because what happens is there's this disconnect between memory controller and the system. System may not allocate a page, but memory controller has no awareness of it. So today, everything gets refreshed, even though you may not be storing anything useful over there. But that's a very good point. People are proposed not refreshing those rows, breaking that breaking the interfaces such that you could inform the memory control, oh, these regions we're not using, so don't even touch them with refresh. So it's, it's sad to see how, how current systems are, right? <laughs> but that's exactly what, it, what being an architect is about. People didn't even think about these problems until very recently, actually. People didn't consider that, but that's a very good way of getting rid of refresh, some of them at least. But if you're utilizing the entire memory, you don't have that luck. Right? If, if you allocated everything, then you cannot do that. But you may, you may develop some other tricks, of course, right? And I'm going to talk uh, about some of the trick. But clearly, this is not good. And if you look at the percentage of DRAM energy spent refreshing, of course, it's a harder calculation to do because you need to assume what fraction of the time are you doing accesses, what fraction of the time are you doing refreshes, and you need to assume some activity factor. But if you, do, if you make some assumptions, maybe to, today you spent about 15% of the DRAM energy with a small device just for refresh, but tomorrow, with a 64 gigabit device, you may be spending almost half of the DRAM energy. Clearly, right now, this is spending most of its time on refresh, actually, because we're not doing any accesses, as far as I know. So this fraction is actually much higher. This is a fraction of DRAM energy spent refreshing. So does it make sense to build a device? Well, it may make sense, but is it efficient to build a device uh, that is not accessible 46% of the time and that's spending 47% of the power budget that is allocated to it on refresh? Probably not good, right? That's not a good scalable solution in the, into the future. So how do we solve the problem? I think you developed one idea. Uh, 
But one other idea is actually assume that your, all of your rows are, uh, and I think to solve the problem you need many, many ideas, not just one idea. It's not clear if one idea will solve the problem. But one idea is all DRAM rows are refreshed uh, every 64 milliseconds today. Do we actually need to do that? Critical thing is do we need to refresh all rows every 64 milliseconds? Not allocated rows, for example. You don't want that. But what if we actually knew how much each row needed to be refreshed? and expose that information to the upper layers. Upper layer meaning it could be the memory controller, it could be the operating system. So let's take a look at the underneath. So underneath, well, this is uniform DRAM. Every cell is equal. Everything is refreshed every 64 milliseconds. But if you actually dig deeper, you have a retention time profile that looks like this. Only a small fraction of cells need to be refreshed every 64 milliseconds because they can retain data uh, only that much. Most of the DRAM cells can retain data for much longer. So you can get away with refreshing them every 256 milliseconds. And there's clearly a distribution over here, which I'm going to show you in a little bit. But even if you recognize this, uh, and maybe ignore this 128 part, refresh, refresh this chunk every 64 milliseconds, and refresh everything else every 256 milliseconds, you get rid of 75% of the refreshes almost, right? If, you're, if you have this awareness. That's the idea, basically. So if you know what's happening underneath, uh, then you can do this. So why do we have such a profile? Any guesses? Why are some cells, uh, some cells can, why do some cells can retain data every 64 milliseconds, whereas some other cells are much stronger? Yes? Variation. Variation, yes. Pro basically, manufacturing is not perfect. Uh, not all DRAM cells are exactly the same, and some are more leaky than others. Some are much stronger than others, and that's manufacturing process variation. Clearly. So how do you take advantage of this profile? Assume that we know the retention time over each row exactly. Now, the question is, how do you what can you do with that information? Who do you expose it to? How much information do you expose? How do you expose it? Because these all affect your efficiency and how do you exploit that, right? Because this affects hardware, software overhead, power consumption, verification, complexity, cost. How do you determine this profile information is another question. I think this is the harder problem, which we were going to discuss briefly today, but maybe we'll get back to it also. So you could expose this to the operating system, for example, and the operating system maybe somehow not even maps those rows uh, that need to be refreshed every 64 milliseconds. Right? You get, yeah, you reduce some memory. You're not able to use some of it, but if, if the distribution is like what I showed you, maybe it's okay. You get rid of, I don't know, a thousand rows in your entire DRAM. Okay, so we're gonna look at both of these things. Who determines the profile information? This is actually the harder part. So it's, it's really a problem that spans across uh, the uh, device, uh, all the way from devices to the runtime system. And someone, someone can even, even imagine some things over here, if, you, if you're really ambitious, that you don't want to modify hardware over here as much. Okay, so this is an observation actually. This is uh, from, from our paper over here. It turns out overwhelming majority of DRAM rows can be refreshed much less often without losing data. This is something that we borrowed from Samsung actually. Uh, Samsung published some data showing that uh, basically, uh, this is the cumulative failure probability of the cell if you use this refresh interval. Basically, what fraction of the cells are failing, in a sense? Uh, if your refresh interval is 64 milliseconds, nothing is supposed to fail. That's the assumption. That may not be true, because testing is actually difficult today for manufacturers, but let's assume that. If you increase the refresh interval to 128 milliseconds, it turns out the failure rate is very small, as you can see, and this corresponds to only 30 cells, assuming this is randomly distributed, which is true, it's about 30 rows in a 32 gigabyte DRAM, which is almost nothing, right? And you climb the curve over here, if you increase the refresh interval to 256 milliseconds, it's only 1,000 rows or cells, which is not bad. So can we exploit this to reduce refresh operations at low cost? Uh, okay, I've already said this. Uh, the key idea is basically one idea could be refresh weak rows more frequently and all other rows rest frequently. Then how do you implement it? That's the idea of this paper. I'm gonna go through this in a little bit because there are interesting bits and pieces over here. So the mechanism relies on three things. First of all, you need to identify the retention time of all of the DRAM rows accurately. This can be done at design time or during operation. It turns out it's not easy to do at design time so because of the factors that we're going to discuss. Uh, you need to do it during operation. So which clearly makes this problem not even more interesting now because DRAM manufacturer cannot determine the retention times, and we'll discuss that in a little bit. Assume that you know this information. So how do you efficiently store 
uh, this information. Now you know the retention time of all the rows. Uh, how do you do it efficiently? Do you actually have two, uh, one bit per row? That is costly, right? That may not be a good idea because you may have huge memory and having one bit per row saying, oh, uh, you need to refresh it frequently every 64 milliseconds or infrequently every 256 milliseconds. It has an overhead of one bit per row. And if you add more DRAM into the system, that now you need to increase the storage capacity that you have in the memory controller, assuming you have this in the memory controller, right? So the idea uh, that we developed was storing rows into the bins by retention time and using Bloom filters for efficient and scalable storage. How many people know about Bloom filters here? Okay, not everyone, so it's good to go over that. I taught it last time in the digital design class. Uh, but I think it's really something so important that we should discuss it, but basically, you store this in balloon filters. We're gonna get back to the balloon filters. Balloon filters are approximate storage, basically. What we're trying to do is represent two sets, right? The set of rows that need to be refreshed frequently and the complement of that set, assuming you have two sets. Uh, set of rows that need to be refreshed infrequently. The realization is that you can represent this approximately, meaning you don't have to use one bit per row in each set, but you can say, oh, these are an approximate set of rows that are approximated by this bit vector that you need to refresh frequently. As long as your errors are false positives, meaning you query the set and the set tells you you need to refresh it frequently and you should always be correct in that case, meaning for a row, for a row that you need to re refresh frequently, the set, this, this data structure, Bloom filter should tell you, you should refresh it frequently. Right. But for a row that you don't need to refresh frequently, the data structure can tell you, okay, refresh frequently. That's fine. That doesn't cause you correctness problems, right? So you can have this false positive. When you query the data structure, the data structure tells you, do it. Even though you don't need it, you'll still be correct. That's the idea of a Bloom filter. You reduce the size of the bit vector that you store. Instead of one bit per row, you may have only a thousand bits. And basically, insert the addresses into those thousand bits with some encoding, hashing. And in the end, whenever you query the set for a row that, you, that needs to be refreshed frequently, you always get refreshed frequently. And whenever you query this uh, data structure for a row that you don't need to refresh frequently, you sometimes get refresh. <laughs> but that's okay. So that's the idea. That's the beauty of a Bloom filter that reduces the storage cost to only 1.25 kilobytes. Whereas if you actually have uh, you could, uh, if you add one bit per uh, row, this could be megabytes, actually. Make sense? We're going to go into the operation in a little bit more detail. Okay. Uh, so refreshing, uh, memory control refreshes rows in different bins at different rates now. Now you have a Bloom filter that says, these are the set of rows that you need to refresh frequently. Whenever you get an address, you access that Bloom filter. Bloom filter tells you refresh or not refresh at this point in time. Basically checks the bins. And now you could actually imagine multiple bins if needed. I think two bins are actually good enough, which means that you have a single bloom filter, low refresh, high refresh rate. But in the paper, we discuss three bins. So you have one bloom filter, another bloom filter, and everything else needs to be refreshed uh, 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 less frequently. So okay, let me give you the results and takeaways. Assuming you can implement this, that's the beauty of architecture, right? As an architect, you dream, even a mechanism you dream. You may not know whether you actually can do it or not. And actually, when we thought about it, we didn't know exactly how to do this. We had our doubts, but my students and I wrote the paper uh, because it's important to dream and enable future. And in the future, we actually enable a lot of other studies. But basically, assuming that we could do it somehow, uh, what happens? Let's take a look at the results. What, well, we, I already said the hardware cost. Refresh reduction, you could calculate it uh, based on it based on the trace, based on the false positives, actually. It's, you reduce the refresh rate by almost 75%. Some of it, uh, it's not exactly 75% because, uh, um, because you need to refresh some more, more frequently and also you have false positive rates. And it turns out the dynamic DRAM energy reduction is about 16%. This is based on simulation. And idle DRAM power reduction is about 20%. And performance improvement is about 9%. Because you get rid of refreshes, now you reduce the delays that refresh is causing on accesses, right? And you could do simulation studies like this as an architect. That's, 
I love this sort of studies because it's really a field of dreams. We're going to talk about simulation, right? You could fool yourself with simulation. You should be very careful. You should not fool yourself. But you could also enable a future that nobody has imagined as well. So this is the one kind of study that you could do, for example. This is device capacity. This is energy per access. And this is auto refresh, which is the baseline refresh mechanism. When you read the paper, you will see that. Uh, with a 4 gigabit device, we can reduce the energy consumption by 16%, as I said over here. But energy consumption reduction with a 64 gigabit device is much larger, about 50%. So this is, if you want a scalable technology, you want, when you go from a small storage cost, small density to high density, you want energy per access to remain constant, right, ideally. But with the baseline refresh mechanism, it's not happening. It's actually increasing exponentially. With radar, it's staying constant somewhat, but it's not enough. Radar is not enough with really large devices, as you can see. Or maybe we didn't really optimize it uh, for that. So there needs to be more mechanisms over here. Uh, and also, this is, uh, what is this? This is the performance improvement. Uh, you'll, you'll read the metrics in the paper. But basically, performance improvement, uh, this is a multi-core metric. You're running multiple applications together. So this is an aggregate metric in terms of how much the system throughput improves. And with a 4 gigabit device, the improvement is about 9%. When the device is 64 gigabits, you get a lot more improvement because you're getting rid of a lot more refreshes. And those refreshes are a much bigger performance bottleneck uh, at high, uh, high density devices. So this is an idea that could become much more effective into the future, basically. It's always good to do these futuristic studies whenever you're designing a new mechanism. OK, today it's good, but how will it scale into the future? Not all ideas scale nicely like this. In the future, you get better. Some ideas actually, with the future trends, they get worse, right? They may still be good to examine, but it's good to examine and report uh, what happens. OK, so this is the paper. And this is another potential reading for your homework one assignment. Clearly, this is not implementable. <laughs> but it's, it's important. Uh, and there are other readings also uh, that I'm going to uh, reference here. So this actually does some of those, these studies, these projections, even more uh, carefully uh, than this paper. OK, I already said this. OK, takeaway two is, uh, the takeaway is we break the abstraction layer. So this enables you to understand and solve the problems. If we didn't know what the circuit, how the circuit behaved underneath, we would never be able to develop something like this. Right? If you didn't know, for example, some pages are not allocated, and we should break the barriers such that we could communicate that information into the memory controller, you couldn't solve some of that problem. Any questions? No? OK. So basically, the second takeaway is cooperation between multiple components and layers can enable more effective solutions and systems. So let's, take, let's dig deeper, making radio work. OK, you publish this paper. You know that it's an important problem. You know that it's, the idea is good. It's going to get better. How do you really make it work? Now, it turns out this is the really hard part. <laughs> it's going to take, uh, because good ideas are usually dime a dozen. Development of ideas are important, and people should be developing it. But making them work are oftentimes a, is, is, is oftentimes a real contribution. And in this case, this, these are easy to do. The hard part is really that one. So when we wrote the paper, we glanced over the issue. Basically, we said to profile a row, you write data to the row. You prevent it from being refreshed, and you measure the time before data corruption. That's correct, actually. That's how you do the testing in DM. That's how, uh, how, how DM manufacturers figure out uh, whether they can retain data for a long time or not. But they add a lot of margin to it. That's how they get to 64 milliseconds. In this case, we're trying to distinguish between different uh, parts of DM. So this is the key problem. Uh, is it really this easy? <laughs> you write some data. Uh, you leave it for some time. You measure when it gets corrupted for different values of n. And uh, as a result, you, you declare a victory. You say the retention time of this row is 64 milliseconds. The retention time of this row is 128 milliseconds. The retention time of this row is 256 milliseconds. Right. Turns out it's not that easy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because of multiple problems. I'm going to discuss one of them in more detail. Maybe we'll get back to the other one also. But there are two things that affect, uh, this is the next paper, basically, which I'm going to reference also. There are two things that affect the retention time significantly that are not easy to determine as a manufacturer. One is data pattern dependence. Oh, I don't talk about it, so I have some slides somewhere else. But data pattern dependence is the retention time of a cell is dependent on the data that's written into it and the data of the cells that are surrounding it. 
Why, why does this happen? Because electromagnetic coupling. Basically, you have capacitive coupling between the bit lines and the bit lines and the bit lines and the word lines. As a result, what value gets stored in adjacent cells affects how fast charge is going to leak from the cell together with the value that's stored in the cell. That's the idea. Which means that you cannot just write once and measure how long you can retain the data because that may not be your worst case data pattern. Right? Now you need to find your worst case data pattern somehow. That doesn't sound good. <laughs> how do you find the worst case data pattern? Well, it may not be that easy, first of all, because you need to really know the structure of the underlying structure of the cells. And also, worst case data pattern may not be the same across the entire device. I'm not sure if I've seen any publication on this that proves that there is a worst case data pattern for the entire device. I don't think that's easy. That's why manufacturers put a lot of margin into the retention time that they find out as well. So this is difficult, clearly. right? You need to figure out the worst case data pattern. If you know the worst case data pattern for every single cell, that's great. But now the testing cost is very high, right? How do you test the DM? First of all, you figure out the DM, uh, worst case data pattern. If you don't have the worst case data pattern, now you need to test it with many, many different data patterns. And there are many d data patterns that you can imagine. Of course, some of them you know will cause more uh, coupling than others, but this depends on the structure of the DRAM also. And the next paper that I'm going to reference actually talks about that. So this is a hard phenomenon. But there is even a harder phenomenon, which is the variable retention time phenomenon, which is really fascinating. And this happens whenever you scale the circuit to really, really small dimensions. But it also happens large, large dimensions, but it's not as big of a problem. And the idea over here is something like this. This is real data uh, at room temperature. Uh, by the way, retention time is dependent on temperature also. Uh, because how fast charge leaks how, uh, depends on how mobile the electrons are. If your temperature is high, you have much higher mobility. Uh, as a result, you leak charge much faster. So 64 milliseconds is really specified for high temperatures. Actually, at high temperatures, 32 milliseconds today. So today, we have temperature compensated refresh. If the temperature is really high, the refresh rate goes, goes to 32, every 32 milliseconds. At low temperatures, we use 64 milliseconds. <laughs> OK, but in this case, we look at temperature uh, uh, at, I think, 45 degrees. Uh, and this is the retention time of the cell. That's why retention times are in seconds. So at low temperatures, you can retain data for much longer. So another solution to the problem is never operate DRAM at high temperatures, right? But good luck with that if you have DRAM uh, sandwiched in between many components over here and underneath your processor that's running at very high temperatures. You might want to carry a cooler with you. <laughs> okay, so this, is, so this is what happens. This is basically the phenomenon of variable retention time. You measure the retention time over time. Time could be hours. And you record what is the retention time of, this, of a given cell. This is a particular cell. This point 6.1 over here means that it, the cell didn't fail, uh, even at the highest uh, retention time we measured, 6.1 seconds. So it can retain data for 6.1 seconds. And these points over here are the failures. Basically, this cell, when tested at time t equals 3.5 hours, it failed when, it's, when, it, when it was when its retention time, when its refresh interval was 2.5 seconds. Normally, you would expect, if, if, the, if the retention time of a cell is constant, you would, say, you would expect a constant curve, right? It could be here, it could be here, it could be here, but it should be constant. But clearly, it's not constant. Over time, you get different retention times for the same cell. Well, why is this happening? This shouldn't happen. <laughs> and the data pattern is the same. I should also say that. The data pattern that we have in the cell and around it is the same. It could be experimental error, which is always the case. But then you need to figure out what the cause of the error is. But this is a real phenomenon in this case. And this is the phenomenon of variable retention time. This was known for a long time. It was first discovered by, in the 1980s. Uh, the idea is charge, uh, it turns out charge gets trapped in the access transistor. And this is a random process, as far as we know. All the data suggests that it's a random process, memoryless. So you cannot predict it as far as we know. Charge gets trapped randomly, and when charge gets trapped inside the access transistor, charge from the capacitor leaks out much faster. So at random points in time, you have low retention time. <laughs> at other times, when charge is not trapped inside the access transistor, your retention time is not low. <laughs> That's the idea. And usually, cells alternate between one or two or three 
well, two or three retention time states. As you can see over here, there are not that many states over here. But you really need to figure out these parts over here, right? This is the lowest retention time that you see. And of course, the question is now, how do you figure out the worst case retention time of this cell? Assuming you found the worst case data pattern, you keep testing it, when are you going to hit the lowest case? You don't know. You have a random process, variable retention time, that's affecting your retention time. That's the difficulty. You could say the DI manufacturer should figure it out somehow. Well, it increases their testing cost quite a bit. And nobody wants to pay more for DRAM. Maybe we should change the mindset and pay more for DRAM, but it's very difficult at this point. Uh, and also, a DRAM manufacturer may not be able to figure this out because retention time characteristics change after you solder a chip on a board, for example. You expose it to high temperatures, and that high temperature affects the characteristics, even if you do it carefully. You have effects like that. So it's not an easy problem to solve, basically. It's not as easy as the DM manufacturer provides you a profile, or you profile it once when you put the DM into the system, and nicely you say, oh, this cell retains data for x milliseconds, this cell retains data for x nanoseconds, whatever. It's not that easy. You need to continuously profile, basically. That's the idea. So this is the implication. There doesn't seem to be a way of determining if a cell exhibits variable retention time without actually ob observing a cell exhibiting VRT. This is in many words saying that this is a random process. Uh, and VRT complicates retention time profiling by, I already said this, I think, actually. I don't want to say it again. <laughs> yes. Basically, manufacturer retention time profile may not be accurate because once you install the memory into the system, you, can get, you may change the profile significantly. So this is what we suggested. One option for future work is essentially add error correcting codes uh, into the DRAM and use them to continuously profile DRAM online while aggressively reducing refresh rate. The idea is, uh, you basically test, uh, you basically reduce the refresh rate a little bit. If you get errors, you take the refresh rate back to a high level. You refresh more. But if you don't get errors, you keep the refresh rate uh, at low rate, because, which means that you have some margin. So and it, having some error correcting codes to correct or to signal you that, oh, you shouldn't reduce refresh rate is a good idea. And actually, DRM manufacturers, after uh, uh, they, I, I'll talk about some other paper, but maybe not in, these, uh, in this slide deck. Uh, they're now adding error correcting codes in mobile chips. You have DRAM with error correcting codes inside it. Basically, the chips are manufactured with error correcting codes inside the chip itself because they're seeing this sort of scaling issues. Yes? Uh, couldn't these procedures also uh, affect the time the, the memory takes to respond? You're profiling if it's not a thing you're doing with that. Yeah. What do you mean, the variable retention time issue? Yeah, if you're, if you're doing this continuous profiling, mm -hmm. then you're doing oh, I see. else apart from accessing that. That's right, yes. Basically, yes, there's an overhead that you have because now you cannot access the part that you're profiling. So the key issue is how do you design a system that minimizes that profiling overhead? That's a fascinating problem. <laughs> yeah, and some of the TAs in this course I've worked on that problem, Minesh sitting in the back over there, Jeremy. Uh, they've developed a mechanism called Reaper, which I will reference very briefly. So clearly profiling overhead is problematic. You don't want to profile your entire DRAM every time. <laughs> okay. And also you need to keep the ECC overhead in check as well. Profiling overhead and the ECC overhead. Okay, so this is the paper. But basically, once we said, okay, we, we like this idea, we want to enable it, then the next question is, you figure out by characterizing real devices what happens. And for this, to enable this, we actually designed a real uh, FPGA-based infrastructure, a memory controller that can, where we can change the refresh rates as much as we want. Because in existing memory controllers, you cannot do that, or we don't have the interfaces to do that, and they're not very capable. But if you have an FPGA-based memory controller, you could attach it to the DRAM, and then you could change the refresh rate, and you can experimentally characterize what is the refresh rate. So there are many conclusions in this paper. Uh, that, uh, that basically I, I just summarized over here just now. But one of the other conclusions is uh, th these problems are getting worse. For example, variable retention time is getting worse in newer generation of DRAM devices. As you reduce the size of the circuit, you're more vulnerable to these random effects. I, I think of this as like a quantum effect, basically. You randomly, <laughs> something flips over here. It's, it becomes more probabilistic. Okay, so basically, uh, 
how can we reliably find the retention time of all DRAM cells so that we can make DRAM more reliable and secure and also higher performance, make techniques like radio work? We're going to talk about security later. Uh, we want to improve performance and energy. So after that, we did a bunch of other work, which I'm not going to just flash over here, but I'm not going to talk about it. But this gives you an example of how research also progresses, right? You may have a vision, a dream. It, you may not immediately enable it, but you need to do a lot of work actually to enable it. This work studies, for example, uh, different kinds of mitigation techniques, again, based on experimental data. I think this is something that works, actually. This is basically proposing essentially what we envisioned in the 2013 paper, uh, using ECC uh, to actually profile dynamically. But it may not always work. There, there is some period where you don't profile, you may actually miss, so you may actually get some errors. If your ECC is strong, I think you can fix that problem. And there are some ideas over here. Basically, you can get rid of some of the data-dependent failures uh, by, uh, OK, I'm not going to talk about that. But basically, I think this idea over here is if you know the current memory content, for example, if your memory content, uh, content for a row is all zeros, and if you're not going to lose charge, maybe you don't need to refresh it, right? <laughs> if you're content aware in your memory. So there are other techniques that you can employ. And this is the paper that I mentioned, how to reduce the profiling overhead. And there's a very complex trade-off space in retention time profiling. And if you're really interested in this, you can talk to Minesh in the back. He's hiding behind his computer. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so this is the most difficult part. The other fun part I'm going to talk about, because it's important, I think, to know about uh, bloom filters, the binning part. That part is easy to solve, because once you realize you can use bloom filters, that's great. So let's talk about. And the problem is, how do you efficiently and scalably store rows into retention time bins? As I said, in the memory, you don't want to be rigid in this, because if you're rigid, you put some data structure in your memory, let's say a bit vector, that assumes to have a single bit for, per row. But what if you add some more memory into your system? Then there's a problem, right? Your data structure needs to grow, but you don't have enough bits in your memory controller. You're stuck. That's not scalable. So you want a scalable solution. And balloon filters are actually a very scalable solution. Uh, basically, as I said, it's a probabilistic or approximate data structure that complexly re represents set membership, presence or absence of an element in a set. Uh, the contrast is with non-approximate set membership. You use one bit per element to indicate absence or presence of each element from a space of n elements. n is the number of rows. Approximate means use a much smaller number of bits and indicate each element's presence or absence with a subset of those bits. That's the idea. Some elements map to the bits, some other elements also map to. That's why you get false positives. And there are multiple operations that you can do on this data structure. You can insert an element into it. You can test the presence of an element. Or you can remove all elements. You cannot remove an individual element because there's aliasing. Right? Some elements map to the same bits. And once you insert one element and another element, once they map to the same bits, you can, you can either remove both or none. But you cannot remove one individually. <laughs> right. <laughs> OK. Uh, I guess you can remove one individually, but you need to know every other thing <laughs> that's inside the set. It's not a scalable solution. <laughs> OK, so let's look at the operation of this. Basically, this is one bin, this many number of bits. Let's assume that we figured out row 1 needs to be inserted because it needs to be refreshed frequently. You basically insert row one. What does that mean? Uh, this, this is one example. You have three hash functions. Inserting means taking the address, hashing it through those hash functions, and setting the bits that the hash functions point to. So this does some hashing. It reduces this address into a location in the bit vector, and you set that bit. This does some other hashing. It reduces the address into a location address in this bit vector. You set it, and same here. And now. The fact that these three bits are set means that row one is inserted. And then if you want to query it during runtime, you basically check. You go through the same hash functions with the same address, and they map to the same bits because that's deterministic, and check whether all of these bits are set. And they're all set. If they're all set, the Bloom filter returns that, oh, this is inside the set. That's the idea. Clearly, this is three hash functions. That's a design choice. You could have a single hash function and set only single bit. But that, reduces, that increases the probability of false positives, actually, it turns out. People have looked at uh, the design choices for this data structure. OK. Uh, now we've inserted row 1. Let's check if row 2 is present. You go through the same hash functions with a different address, row 2's address. The first hash function maps to here. It's 0. The second hash function maps to here. It's 1. 
Mm. The third, third hash factor ma maps to zero. For row two to be present, all of these needed to be one, but they're not one. As a result, the Bloom filter tells row two is not inserted. But if you had only this hash function, this would have been a false positive, right? Because you would conflict. Row one and row two would map to uh, this location only with a single hash function. That's why you have multiple hash functions here. Okay, let's insert row four. We insert row four. It goes through the same hash functions with a different address, maps to different bits. Now both row one and row four are inserted over here. Let's test if row five is present. Well, we didn't insert row five. We insert just row one and row four. Now we're checking row five. We go through the hash functions and all of them happen to map to once or locations that contain once because row one and row four, when they were inserted, they set these bits to once. Now this is a false positive. Row five was never inserted. We never thought that it should be refreshed frequently, but it happens that it maps to the same bits that were inserted, that, that were set by some other rows that we thought should be refreshed frequently. This is okay in this case because our problem, uh, in this case, if we refresh row five more often, that's the, that's the semantic meaning of this uh, bit vector. Whatever hits in this bit vector or bloom filter, you're gonna refresh more often, it's okay. We could refresh memory even more often today, right? No problem, except for energy and performance. You don't run into correctness problems. Okay, so this is the paper. I would definitely recommend that you take a look at it. It's a very, relatively short paper, but it's very fundamental from 1970. And this, is, this, this data structure is not just hardware, right? We use it in hardware because it's not complex, but it could be, you could use it in software. There are many software algorithms that take advantage of bloom filters. And I'm not sure if I want to go over uh, here. I mean, it's, the terminology is different, of course, as you can see. It's, it's analyzing hash coding. The paradigm problem considered is that of testing a series of messages one by one for membership in a given set of messages. That's essentially what we're doing also over here. And the computational factors considered are the size of the hash area, space, the time required to identify a message as a non-member of the given set, reject time, and then allowable error frequency. That's the false positive rate, allowable error frequency. So that's an approximate uh, set membership method. And you can read uh, more over there. It's fun to read these old papers. Okay, so let's look at the advantages and disadvantages. The other thing in this course is we'll talk a lot about advantages and disadvantages of different methods. So it's good, this is really important for critical analysis. But you could analyze a data structure the same way. Uh, so one big advantage is clearly what we wanted to do. You wanted to be storage efficient and this gives you a storage efficient representation of set membership, right? Insertion and testing for set membership are actually really fast. Of course, insertion and testing depends on how complicated your hash functions are. And there's a trade-off here. You can make your hash function extremely complicated and slow, which could reduce your false positive rate. So there's a trade-off between hash function size and false positive rate, hash function complexity. Uh, the big advantage in this case is no false negatives. If a bloom filter says an element is not present in the set, the element must not have been inserted. That's true. Uh, you don't get false, false negatives. And false negative, we don't want false negatives in our problem. So not all problems w uh, map well to bloom filters. In this case, this problem maps well because we don't want false negatives. We don't want, even if, if, if we insert something, we don't want a response saying, oh, you didn't insert it. Because we insert it thinking that you're gonna refresh it more often because there's a problem with this row. Okay, now we enable trade-off between time, how, how fast you can determine set membership, storage efficiency, how big is your bit vector, and false positive rate. You can size and hash, and you can have multiple levels of balloon filters also. Okay, disadvantages are of course false positives. An element may be deemed to be present in the set, but it may never have been inserted. If your problem cannot tolerate these false positives, then this is not a good solution. But in this case, we have a problem that can tolerate the false positives. And there are many problems that can actually tolerate uh, this. Yeah, not the right data structure where you cannot tolerate false positives. Okay, basically, uh, I, I already said this before, so I'm gonna go through this relatively quickly. We can tolerate false positives here, but uh, we cannot tolerate false negatives, but Bloom filter doesn't give us false negatives. So that's good, no correctness problems. It's scalable. A Bloom filter never overflows, unlike a fixed size table. You could keep inserting stuff into it. You keep setting bits, your false positive rate keeps increasing, but you're never incorrect. You never run out of space, right? In the, in the worst case, your false positive rate, rate becomes 100%. Yes, you could argue that it's useless, but you don't run out of space. That's the idea, so that's be beautiful. And it's also efficient, uh, basically, as I said earlier, 
just for two filters, you need 1.25 kilobytes as opposed to megabytes. OK, I think we already said this. Basically, you, this is useful when you can tolerate false positives. And Raider is one example, but uh, we've used it for some other examples. So I like this paper quite a bit, but it's not clear if we're going to cover it. So if you're interested, you can take a look at another use of Bloom filters in hardware. OK, refreshing is the easy part. Uh, this is the refresh controller. Once you have a, a Bloom filter-based bin, you choose a refresh candidate row. And a re, a can, you basically keep generating addresses. And at some point, uh, uh, your address, an address comes. And you check which bin it is in and determine if you need to refresh it at this point or you defer refresh for later. And this is the algorithm. You can read the paper in more detail. So the baseline design of the Razor, as it's proposed in the paper, is uh, in the controller. Today, today, actually, refresh control is very interesting. It used to be in the controller in the past. Now uh, people put it in the DRAM. The controller is dumb, actually, right now. It just sends refresh, refresh, <laughs> refresh every some number of microseconds. And memory refreshes internally some number of rows. The controller has no idea what's being refreshed. The memory chip handles all of that. That's why it's called auto-refresh. Automatically, memory chips are refreshing it. Raider can be here or inside here. If it's here, now you need to take the refresh control out of the DRAM chip, right? which means that you control. Memory controller should control the refresh control. Now there's overhead, of course, and Basically, you need to issue additional commands per row refresh. You cannot just say refresh. You need to explicitly say, oh, I want to refresh this address, meaning, to, meaning I activate this and then pre-charge. That's the idea. Or you could do it inside the DRAM. Now you have some other overheads, but you don't change the interface. Now you can still say refresh, but uh, you may not need to wait uh, for Basically, you may not need to wait until, uh, as, as you would wait otherwise. So you need to change the interface a little bit over here. I'm not going to go into the detail over here. OK, and I've already given you this. OK, let's see how much time we have. Probably not much time. Two more minutes. <laughs> so what else can you do to reduce the impact of refresh? What else can you do if you know the retention time of the rows? How can you accurately measure the retention time of the EM rows? So this is a recommended reading. It could be uh, in your homework one also. Let's see. But this is a fascinating problem. In fact, this is the scaling problem. That's the key scaling problem of DRAM. When someone talks about, oh, it's difficult to scale DRAM to smaller technology nodes, it's because of refresh. Because it's very difficult to determine the retention times. If you take out that burden from the DRAM manufacturer, they can solve the other, hopefully, easier problems. Whereas the refresh is solved uh, by us. OK, so we'll keep digging deeper in this course. As I said, making ideas work is the real contribution. Any questions? Otherwise, we're going to stop for today. Nothing burning, no new ideas for getting rid of refresh. OK, maybe you can think about it a little bit. And we'll continue discussing tomorrow. OK, see you.